The first item on our agenda is the oath of office for newly elected town council members and school board members. So I'd ask John McGinty, um, Trish Brigham to the school board, and I myself will go down to the floor to take the oath of office. Okay, um, now the clerk can call the roll. Chairman Lynch? Present. Councilor Backer? Present. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor McKenzie? Here. Councilor Moles? Here. Councilor Roberts? And Councilor Swift Kayata? Here. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we have uh, reports and correspondence. Are there any? Councilor McGinty. Uh, last Wednesday, I attended my first meeting of the Executive Committee of the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Um, we passed a budget for upcoming fiscal year. Uh, the good news is that they are reducing our dues by 5%. So I think that amounts to probably about 450 bucks, but it's a 5% reduction. That's the good news. That's the only news. Yes. Thanks, John. Other reports? I just wanted to take a moment. Our uh, student council representatives are not here tonight, and I'm sorry that they're not. Um, Skylar Armstrong had emailed me that she was unable to attend, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank them both for serving as student council representatives to the town council um, this year. Um, they've done a great job. They've been to um, every meeting. They graduated um, last week with their class, and. Uh, I want to, on behalf of the council and the town of Cape Elizabeth, wish them uh, their best in their college careers and in the future. They've been great members. Uh, they've participated in some of our discussions, um, talked to us about the traffic situation at the high school. Um, one of them um, had some comments on cell phone issues, so they've been active um, representatives of the youth of our town, and I do thank them for their participation. Okay, the next item on our agenda is um, a presentation by the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation, and I know that um, Clint Blood, the president, is here. Is there anyone else here? Uh, Jeff Van Fleet is here as well, so I will go down to the microphone. I'm going to take this this way. As, as Mary Ann has, has indicated, um, my name is Clint Blood, and I'm the new president of Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. 
It's a distinct honor to be the president, having been just elected last week by my fellow board members. And I know I speak on behalf of our fellow board members in looking forward to working with the town council, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, as well as the citizens of Maine in achieving our goal of financial independence of Fort Williams Park. And with that in mind, I'd like to introduce the past president, Jeff Van Fleet, who was our original president and, and was the man who really has spent, time, spent many hours working to get the foundation established to make a presentation to the town. Jeff? Thank you very much, Clint. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the town council, the government of Cape Elizabeth four years ago for having the vision to authorize the establishment of a charitable foundation to benefit Fort Williams. Uh, it's been a few years, and tonight it's uh, a real pleasure to present this first grant to the town, uh, a grant which I hope will be the first of many more uh, to come. Uh, we solicited uh, in Cape Elizabeth and outside of Cape Elizabeth, uh, we received over 325 donations and at this point, I'll hand over the check. We get the right photo opportunity here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You're welcome. Jeff, thank you. You're quite welcome. And Clint, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank God. Jeff, who is an um, outgoing president, um, it's basically the fruit of his labors and, of course, the labors of the rest of the charitable foundation that has made this grant possible. And this grant will be used um, as um, to pay for an engineering study on um, how we can um, save or address uh, the Goddard Mansion, which is currently in a state of disrepair. So we appreciate very much the efforts of both of these gentlemen and the entire foundation, and we thank you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. If I could have uh, Mike Judge <laughs> step up to the um, step up to the plate, Mike. Thank you. Mike is. Um, has been chairman of the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission for the last few years, and he was selected um, by the American Hiking Society for um, an honor um, volunteer of the year. Mike has um, just been a, a tremendous volunteer to the town. Um, he, as I mentioned, he served on the Conservation Commission for two years. During his tenure, a number of things were accomplished. Um, the um, Greenbelt Plan won the uh, Maine Association of Planners Award for the year. The Gullcrest Master Plan was completed. The St. Bart's Easement Trail was approved, and I think that's close to completion now. Um, the first Cape Trails Day was held. Mike also negotiated the Golden Ridge Trail Swap, and I understand that Mike cuts lumber like Paul Bunyan. Um, <laughs> that he has spent many hours of his own rebuilding the Great Pond Bridge Trail. And on one occasion, he actually was in Bangor. He drove back to Cape Elizabeth for a town council workshop and back to Bangor again that night. Uh, so that shows the kind of dedicated um, volunteer that Mike is. And it really has been just a tremendous service to the town. So I'm pleased to present um, these gifts from the American Hiking Society. There's a compass and flashlight, a guide to volunteerism, and a beautiful keep on trekking teacher. So, Mike, thank you. Mike, I would be remiss too if I didn't mention that there are other members of the Conservation Commission who are here with us tonight. John Herrick and Mike Pulsifer 
Um, I hope I haven't missed anyone else in the audience. Um, we very much appreciate um, Mike's work and the work of all of the commission. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Okay, uh, the town manager's report. The town manager is not here, but the assistant town manager, Deborah Lane, is here. Do you have anything to report, Deborah? A couple of things. Interesting enough, that she goes in the vein of volunteerism here in our community. Two things like report on. Uh, the Cable Street Garden Club recently obtained a grant to landscape the Thomas Memorial Library. Many of you have probably seen that project that has just begun and is ongoing um, in conjunction with the Friends of the Thomas Memorial Library. So again, we see volunteerism in our community uh, and we certainly appreciate those two groups and their efforts uh, on the citizens' behalf. The second is uh, Family Fun Day. Uh, again, a group of citizens, the Family Fun Day volunteers, um, will be holding this event this Saturday, which is June 19th. There are flyers uh, around information, I believe, on our website or can be on our website. Uh, we have received calls recently for folks that want to participate in Family Fun Day, and they're encouraging them to contact Ken Smith, the chairman, at 799-8515. Uh, so again, we can... Uh, for a, a nice day on Saturday, if not, the rain date is um, the following June 26th. So. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. Okay, the next item is um, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. If you are here and would like to bring something to the council's attention that is not on the agenda later this evening, this is an opportunity for you to do so. So um, if you'd like to do so, please step up to the microphone and uh, Give us your name and address, please. Madam Chairman, my name is David Sawyer. And my address is 10 Charlotte Street, South Portland. I request permission to speak to the council. Thank you. I want to speak to the council regarding the uh, Maine Supreme Court's recent reversal the Blueberry Ridge subdivision. There's just a few things that I think are important for the council to know about, and I would like to ask your assistance. I want to tell you that my comments represent my opinion only, although there are many uh, in sympathy with my position. But first of all, we Dana Park neighbors are not monsters or evil, evil people. We're a mix of, of typical Americans living in a neighborhood that was designed before there was an ordinance, very tight, with undersized lots and fairly narrow streets. I think the developer's landscaping expert put it best when he said our houses were cheap by jowl. We have a delicate balance of people's needs and desires in this setting, and we have uh, special challenges because of that. One is to make sure that this delicate balance is not tipped too far and our lifestyle is ruined. We're not opposed to development. In fact, we welcome responsible development. We share the same goals as most people, safety, access to services, access to recreational opportunities such as open space, protection from deleterious conditions. We were hopeful based on the history of how strictly Cape Elizabeth has afforded protections to its neighborhood that we would get similar protections for us. We felt that the uh, Blueberry Ridge plan did not achieve these goals. And we contacted the Cape Elizabeth Planning Office for help in trying to shape some kind of a compromise. We also tried to establish, in many ways, channel or channels of communication between the two, two communities and between the developer and ourselves. We simply wanted this expansion of our neighborhood to be reasonable. But we soon found out two key things. One is that the developer was not going to compromise. And the second thing we found out is that we were going to be treated callously and unsympathetically by the Cape Planning Board office, the Cape Planning Office, sometimes getting no answers or poor answers to our questions and no direction. 
taking the only protective action that we could, we sought help from the city of South Portland to discontinue the ends of Charlotte Street and Edgewood Road. We didn't want to do that. The town of Cape Elizabeth, as it turns out, had committed, com committed itself to a bad plan. This plan was taken to the state planning office, which would not endorse it. And the state's very interested in open space planning and, co and combating sprawl. And also, this plan was characterized by the state Supreme Court justice in their deliberations, Justice, justice Howard Dana, is the antithesis of open space planning. The antithesis of open space planning. Can you imagine our frustration when we were given a vegetated buffer of zero feet, which is just made up of a stockade fence? While on the roadwood development on the same Rustashi property, got a no cutting area of anywhere from 50 to 100 feet and sometimes more. Can you blame us for feeling that we were less, we felt less protected than our Cape Elizabeth neighbors? So the town of Cape Elizabeth brought, bought into the plan and they carried the flag to, for this plan to the extent that we were sandbagged by the planning office every time we tried to seek information or help. Another example that the town manager in a phone conversation with me characterized me as a liar. The town manager interfered with my wife's job by going to her supervisor and trying to get her to withdraw from, the, from opposing the plan for a conflict of interest. Fortunately, her supervisor didn't buy that one. And there was no attempt by the Cape Council manager planning board or planner to sit down with all parties and work things out. And finally, after years of research, we were limited to three minutes of testimony at the planning board. When I served as the chairman of the South Portland planning board, we never put any time limits on people speaking. We didn't understand that. Cape Elizabeth, in my opinion, squandered its precious resources and damaged intermunicipal relations in support of a bad plan. This did not have to happen. It could have been avoided by the tried and true methods of cooperation, mediation, reconciliation, and yes, compromise. Cape Elizabeth methods of, of lack of leadership, stonewalling, obfuscation, interference with a person's livelihood, and other unjust methods were not only doomed to fail, but do not serve the people of Cape Elizabeth well. You've seen the result. This is a costly, unnecessary mess. I, I'm asking you tonight, respectfully, if we could solve the problem at hand. At this time of year, with graduations and, and weddings abounding, the word commencement is in the air. I would ask the council to commence or to begin a new chapter in this distressing story. I strongly believe that the development can be built in the problems of adequate buffering, drainage, access to open space, and services can be solved. I know that it's not normally up to the council to provide to uh, solve planning problems, but there's some intermunicipal concerns here such as the Edgewood Road problem that remain unsolved, which I believe rest within the purview of the council. I hope that you can use your influence in a positive, creative fashion and find out what went wrong, patch things up and get things moving in a positive direction. My neighbors and myself stand ready to assist any kind of positive effort. Thank you for letting me express myself on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council? Okay. Okay, then the next item on our agenda <coughs> is the minutes of um, the meeting held on May 10th, 2004. And a motion would be in order. And then we'll take the next minute. Okay. I move acceptance of the meeting held May 10th, 2004. Second. 
Okay. Any discussion? I'd like to propose one change to the minutes, if I could. Uh, we're on our May 10 minutes. We are on the May 10 minutes. Um, there is a reference under, report, under reports and uh, correspondence to a comment that I had made discussing the upcoming MMA referendum question, stating that I had renewed my pledge that any increase realized by passage of the proposal would be used to decrease the budget. Um, that was, in fact, not quite what I had said, rather that it would be used to decrease the amount raised from property taxes. So if we could just have that uh, change reflected, I would appreciate it. Okay. Friendly amendment, okay. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion as amended? 7 zero. Six zero. thank you. Um, the next item is the um, approval of the minutes of the meeting held June 3rd, 2004. I move approval of the minutes for the town council meeting of June 3rd, 2004. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, zero. Thank you. And the next item is election of a town council chairman for 2004-2005. Councilor McGinty. Um, I move the election of Ann Swift Cayetta as the chairperson for the town council for 2004-2005. Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor. It's a vote, six, zero, and we will switch seats now. We will switch seats, but if you could join me at the podium, we have a little presentation. I've already dropped the plaque on floor one, but I needed to get it back together. Um, I have a few words that I'd like to say um, about our outgoing chair, Mary Ann Lynch. A year ago, Mary Ann Lynch was elected by the town council to be its chairman. During the past 12 months, she has skillfully led the council through a time of significant changes and thorny issues in Cape Elizabeth. Among them, the town votes on our new school building, the sale of the town center lot, which is due to close very soon, we hope. An important discussion of road safety and traffic issues in town, two issues for which she has been a steady and effective advocate. Two statewide votes on tax reform in Maine. An examination of the need for additional cell towers in town, which she's going to be turning over to my jurisdiction in a few moments. <laughs> the adoption of a wonderful new master plan for Fort Williams, and lest we forget, an alewife harvesting plan, which was one of our toughest issues to actually get that plan done. We must especially recognize her many contributions in her work on the school building committee, on Maine Municipal Association's legislative policy committee, and in her creation of Cape Elizabeth's very important tax cap task force. Marianne has shown herself to be a master of both the numbers and the nuances of town government. Her strong leadership, both inside and outside the council chambers, her cool head and willingness to listen to all points of view, and her advocacy for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth have all made her an effective town council chair. I personally am grateful for her friendship and the wise counsel she has offered me during my recent tenure as finance chair. So please join me in thanking her on the behalf of the town council and the citizens of Cape Elizabeth in thanking Mary Ann Lynch for the fine job she has done as the 2003-2004 town council chairman. Uh, 
I'll just say again, it has been um, really my privilege and pleasure to serve with this council and in this community. Um, Mike Duddy um, is a tremendous volunteer, but there are so many other um, people, so many other Mikes out there in this town. Um, and a bunch of them are sitting right up here as your town councilors. So um, I'm really quite humbled by all this, and I would just say thank you for the privilege and pleasure. Um, okay, uh, before we move on to item number two, if you could indulge me just for a moment, please. Um, this will be very brief, but I want to thank my fellow councillors for their confidence in electing me as chairman of the town council. I will do my best to serve you and the, the people of Cape Coast as well. Um, but I felt it important to talk for a moment about the coming year, which will be a challenging one for Cape Elizabeth. Three different priorities are on my mind. First, property taxes and other fiscal issues. The town and schools are facing many financial pressures. Health insurance and employee benefit increases, decreased revenues and declining state aid, rising fuel costs, lower investment returns, skyrocketing waste disposal costs, and so on. It's sort of a grim list. The pending Pulaski tax cap referendum, if it passes, will cut property tax revenue to Cape Elizabeth, the town government, by four and a half million dollars. That's 23% cut from our current $26 million town budget. Such a decrease would mean significant and painful cuts in town and school services. The council must be ready for what will happen in November. While we hope for the best, we must plan for the worst as we work to balance the many important competing needs of all Cape citizens. The second priority I see for the town is moving the school building project forward towards successful completion. The schools are at the heart of our small community. And while it is primarily and rightfully a school board responsibility, the town council stands ready to do all it can to help ensure that the high school and kindergarten facilities are completed on time and on budget to become the best resources possible to further our children's education. And third and last, I look forward to working closely with all of Cape Elizabeth's boards and commissions, and in particular, the school board and our town's new school superintendent, who um, should be starting soon. We must all work together to deal successfully with tax reform and the other critical issues facing Cape Elizabeth. <clears throat> together with town employees, citizen volunteers are the glue that hold our community together and make it a great place to live. I'm eager to listen to and meet with any citizen who needs my help or who wants to share his or her opinions on any issue in town. By listening and understanding each other's views, we all become stronger and more able to work effectively together on the important issues our community is facing. I greatly appreciate the hard work and sacrifices all our many citizens make to make Cape Elizabeth the wonderful community that it is. Please always feel free to contact me with your thoughts, ideas, and comments. And I know the other counselors feel that way too. I look forward to working with you all, and thank you very much for your, for your faith in me. Thank you. Okay, that's enough speechifying. Now we need to get on to some real work here. Um, item number two, adoption of town council rules. This is something that we do every year, but I think it's important that we focus on it for the sake of everybody knowing where everybody else is at and what we're supposed to be doing at what time. So do I hear a motion on item number two? I move adoption of the town council rules. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll move the question. All in favor? Six zero, thank you. Okay, the next item. Item number three, appointment of the finance com uh, committee chair. Do I hear a motion? I, I move uh, appointment of the finance committee with um, David Backer as chairman uh, and the council as a whole to serve as the finance committee. 
been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's 6-0, unanimous. And I congratulate David Backer on his election as chair. I'll be passing you a lot of my files, probably sometime in the near future. Should I send a moving truck over? <laughs> I'll purge them before I send them over. Um, item number four, appointment of an ordinance committee. Do I hear a motion? I move appointment of the ordinance committee with John McGinty as chair, David Backer, and Jack Roberts as member. Second? I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. And I congratulate Councillor McGinty as chair of ordinance. And having just got off that committee myself, I, I'm sure he will do a fine job with the intricacies of the laws of this town. So good luck. Right. Item number five, appointment of an appointment committee. Do I hear a motion? David? I move the appointment of Michael Moles as chairman and Carol Fritz and Marianne Lynch as members. Is there a second? Second. Then moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous, and I congratulate Mike Moles on his appointment as the chair of appointments. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I would like to say that of all the committees, that is one of the toughest committees to be on because when we go to fill a position on a board, this town has some of the best volunteers you would ever meet, and it's always extremely difficult to pick between one qualified volunteer and another. We're, we're very blessed to have such great volunteerism and capability. Thank you. Item number six, appointment of a representative and alternate to RWS Incorporated Board of Directors. Do I hear a motion? Councilman McGinn. I move appointment of Carol Fritz as representative of Mary Ann Lynch as the al alternate to RWS. Is there a second? Second. And moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Congratulations. Item number seven, appointment of representatives of a representative to the Greater Portland Council of Governments Executive Committee. Do I hear a motion? You do. <laughs> The outgoing <laughs> Council of Government. That was the outgoing representative. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I heartily move <laughs> and endorse the appointment of John McGinty as CAPE's representative to the Greater Portland Council of Governments Executive Committee. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I second that. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Congratulations, Councilor McGinty. I accept. <laughs> That's good, because you just got elected. Um, item number eight, appointment of a representative and an alternate to the Greater Portland Council of Governments General Assembly. Do I hear a motion? Councilor Lynch. I move the appointment of Carol Fritz as representative and Jack Roberts as alternate to the Greater Portland Council of Governments General Assembly. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Congratulations to both of you. Item number nine, appointment of a representative to the PACS Policy Committee. And someone may have to help me with what PACS is. It's the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation Study. I think <laughs> study? I think it's okay. It's the transportation thing. Um, I move a, uh, appointment of Mike McGovern to be the PAX representative on okay. policy committee. Is there a second? Councilor Lynch, I'll second that. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, I want to wish everybody good luck in their various new committee assignments. Um, item number 10. Moving on, 
This is um, this item has to do with the Good Table renewing their um, application for a liquor license. There is an opportunity for public comment, which precedes our vote. Is there anyone out there in the public who would like to speak on this matter? I see no one. So the public comment section session is closed. Is there a motion? Yes, I'd Councilor like to make a motion. A motion we renew the liquor license for the good table at 527 Ocean House Road. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Just to note that Mr. Kostopoulos, the owner of the good table, is here as he always is at our organizational meeting and, and enjoys it. He actually remembered it too, so I'm glad that I called to remember it. <laughs> so I would just point that out. So if anyone did have any questions, he was here representing the good table. Welcome. Any questions or comments? No discussion? I'm sorry? Revision. Oh, revision. <laughs> Okay, um, it's been moved and seconded. No discussion, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much and congratulations. Okay, moving right along. Um, item number 11, uh, if I could, if you could indulge me for a moment. It has to do with a report from the planning board um, having to do with the tower overlay district at the um, Portland Water District water tower site located at 11 Avon Road. And I'm not sure procedurally how to handle this, but Councillor Roberts is not here because of a family emergency and he thought he would be, he really wanted to participate in this discussion and uh, he thought he might be able to attend. He didn't know when he'd be arriving. He's going to try to make the meeting depending upon the family situation. And uh, I suggested that perhaps we could push this to the end of the agenda to accommodate him. Um, I'm not sure procedurally, if, would we be taking it out of order or could I, could I make table a motion? Table it. Could we? Mm. Just table it. Could I make a motion to table it until the end of this night's meeting? Before we have that motion though, okay. I just wonder if there are people here who ah. came to speak on that. That's an excellent question. I'm sorry. Is anyone else? So, um, is there anyone out there who would, uh, who is here to, A, who is here to speak on that matter and B, um, would be inconvenienced? Well, of course you'd be inconvenienced by waiting till the end of the meeting. Is there anyone here who'd like to speak on that matter? No. Um, since there's no members of the public, I know Ms. O'Meara is he here to be a resource for us, but if you can hang in until Councillor Roberts arrives, I think he would greatly appreciate it. So, okay, so we move to table it and take it out of order after item. Well, why don't we move to table it Just until Councillor Roberts until Councillor Roberts appears? Okay. So or moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. There's no discussion on a tabling motion, so all in favor? Okay, it's unanimous to table it until Councillor Roberts arrives, or I presume until the end of the meeting, whichever comes first. Thank you very much. I'm sure he appreciates it. Um, item number 12, consideration of a recommendation from the Conservation Commission for the Town Council to amend the original approval expanding the Greenbelt Trail in the Hi Highlands neighborhood, the St. Bartholomew's easement extension. That's sort of a mouthful. Um, just to sort of orient us on this one, I think Ms. O'Meara may be able to provide us with a brief overview on this. Thank you, Maureen. I, I do want to apologize. My goal was to have a nice big map so that I could point to it for you, and I had severe technical difficulties, so that's the only way to describe it. Um, but everyone in, has in your packet, I believe it's page three, this map right here. And I would suggest you all refer to it or we'll all be hopelessly lost. Um, the reason this is before you because is because it's been before you a year ago. And there was a decision made by the council based on a recommendation from the Conservation Commission. And it appears that there's sufficient information or, or in need to protect, perhaps amend the original decision of, of the council. So. What we have here on this map, the dark area is land that's currently owned by the town. 
and extending off the map is what we call the Highlands Trail, which extends from Pine Ridge Road and Broad Cove. And right above it, where this splashed area is, is what we call the St. Barth's easement. This property used to be owned by St. Bartholomew's Church. And when they came in for their fellowship hall, we talked about how nice it would be if the town had an easement around this pond area because we own this land here and we have a little easement off to the side here that's located on what we call the Mullen property. So the idea was to connect the two eventually to have a pathway that the neighbors could use. Uh, we got that easement from the St. Bartholomew's Church, but it was a donation. We didn't, we were happy to receive it. And they did put a condition on it that the attached area is what we have for five years. At the end of five years, all we have is where the trail is located. And we are, we're right on top of that deadline. So we're pushing very hard to actually lay the, the trail out in the world because if it doesn't exist by the time we hit the five-year deadline we lose everything so that whole connection that we were looking to get from this point to this point would be gone um, in that whole effort to to try to create that trail there was a lot of public comment we actually had two neighbors the Sullivan's and the Pillsbury's say look we would really like you to put the trail down by us we like this idea of having a connection to Two Lights Road. And the commission, the Conservation Commission, I should mention they're here and they're willing to speak on this, but I'm sure they're ready to have me do as much of it as possible. Uh, so we have this, this trail we've actually put in that starts at Two Lights Road down here. It connects up with this land that we own right here, and we're working on this part right here. But this neighbor, the Mullins, were very uh, concerned about the location of this trail. And in an effort to address their concerns, there was an agreement not to clear this trail right here. We had decided that we would make this a destination point. It's actually a very picturesque pond in there. Uh, it's obvious that there are people walking in there now. And we said, we will, we will mark the entire trail on the portion of the St. Bart's easement that we're going to lose. And then we'll stop on the property line, the Mullen property, put up a sign that says no trespassing and have people turn around and walk back. Uh, what has since happened is that the Mullins have erected a fence here and they are now requesting that we actually do go in and clear this trail so it becomes a loop that the entire neighborhood can use. And there's also in your packet not only a letter from uh, the Mullins but also a letter from the Hollages, uh, Ted Hollage who lives right here. And he's been able in the past to uh, access this area walking over the Mullin property and he's been invited to do that, but he's uncomfortable doing that now. So he also supports clearing this, this easement out. And it's a 15 foot wide easement. And what we would do is clear a five foot wide path in this 15 foot wide area. So that we would now have this connection coming up from Two Lights Road all the way here into the Highlands and also making the loop out to Two Lights Road in this direction. And the Conservation Commission Chair John Harris is here tonight as well, but the Commission has reviewed this, this request by the Mullins and they're supportive of it. So does that answer any questions? Councilor Fritz. Um, I, I walked the trail today and I'm just curious where on this map the existing Mullins fence is. If you where did you start? How's that? I started from Two Lights Road along the Sullivan property in the end. Okay. And you, you walk in and you have to look for a very sharp left-hand turn. I mean, I found the fence. You I'm found saying, fence. where is it on this we, map? Is I, it I on am, yeah, and that is the big question. I am almost positive that the fence is along this back line and set 15 feet back from their property line, which means the fence does not include the town's 15 foot wide easement. The reason I'm comfortable that that's the case is because in this corner right here, that where the Mullen property intersects with the Poolin property, there's a pin sticking out of the ground. It has a big yellow cap on it. You never have a pin that's that visible. Uh, we've also had a survey done of this area by the St. Bartholomew's Church when they gave us the easement that also showed the same kind of configuration. And two years ago, I was out there with Jerry Watts, who's a surveyor with Oast Associates, and we walked this area to confirm where we thought the easement was. So for that reason, I, I think Mr. Mullen did a very good job of locating his fence where his property line is. Where the property line is, or Minus 15, the 15 minutes, feet. Or 15 That's right. Feet. 
Excuse me, and it's minus the 15 feet on the side. It's on along the side. property uh, line, sort of along the back of the Absolutely, farm. and we've, we've walked back there before, uh, Jerry Watts and I, we found the corner pin I mentioned, and we found another pin further back. We were out there right around the same time they put their dog fence in, so it was actually fairly easy to find. Um, and finding pins is, you know, it's like the gold standard of trying to figure out where, where a property line is. So it's one of the places where I feel relatively confident that we know where everything is. Are there any more questions for Maureen? Thank you. It, Would anyone from the Conservation Commission like to speak? Or you don't have to, but if you want to, feel free. John Hart, uh, Chair of the Conservation Commission. I can only re reiterate uh, what Maureen said, and we have sent you a memo. The Conservation Commission has studied this at some length, and we've all been out there a number of times, and we've talked to the Mullins, and I've talked to Pam Mullins a couple of times myself on her property, um, and we, uh, we believe this is the uh, best solution, is to clear that easement. And uh, Peter Mullin has volunteered to uh, to help to work with the Conservation Commission during this clearing exercise. So I, uh, we, we do uh, endorse this uh, change to the, uh, to the ordinance. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. Councilor Lynch. Would a motion be in order? Yes, it would I, be. I would move to authorize the clearing of a trail on the pedestrian easement located on the Mullen property. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, we'll move the question, but I will note for the record that Councillor Roberts has been able to join us, so we now have seven votes total. All in favor? It's unanimous. It's 7-0. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the hard work of the Conservation Commission and of Ms. O'Meara, and I also want to... Um, thank all the neighbors involved, um, inclu especially including the Mullins, who um, are so generously offering to help clear the trail. And uh, I just want to um, say I think this is going to be a great asset for the community. Thank you. Um, Councilor Roberts, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to move that we remove item 11 from the table. Thank you. Second. It's been moved and seconded to remove um, the cell tower item, which was item number 11, from the table. Discussion? I don't know if there's discussion on this or not. No, All in favor? No discussion. All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's unanimous. 7-0. Okay, so we will move back to item number 11, which is a report from the um, planning board has to do with the designation of a tower overlay district on the Portland Water District water tower site located at 11 Avon Road. That's in Shore Acres. Um, is there a motion? Councillor Lynch. And I will move acceptance of the report's recommendation that a tower overlay district not be created in Shore Acres at 11 Avon Road. Second that. It's been moved and seconded. <clears throat> uh, is there any discussion? <coughs> Councilor Roberts, move a little faster than you. Councilor Roberts. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, I have a question for Maureen. Is she, uh, she's still here. I had emailed you earlier, but then I had to leave work early, and I don't know if you ever responded to my email or not. So, do you know if anybody from the planning board visited? or had any correspondence or communications with any of the other towns that utilize water towers as uh, co to co-locate the uh, communication towers on them? I, I have no knowledge of any specific communication between any plan board member regarding a water tower. I can tell you that during their discussions of this issue, many board members referenced things they had seen in other places, including the town of Yarmouth. However, uh, I believe that their final decision was based on the coverage maps that were provided by LCC International, where they looked at how much 
of the town could be provided with wireless phone coverage from an antenna that was mounted at the height of the water tower, which is 80 feet. And their decision was that for that impact, there wasn't enough coverage. So that they didn't look at whether it was appropriate in that neighborhood or whether it was a commercial use. They just said basically that there wasn't enough bang for the buck. Okay, thank you. Councilor Fritz. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeffrey. I, I can make my other comments for oh, no, afterwards. No, go ahead. Um, we were into comment, I guess, basically. My concern with accepting the report as written was I had written the paper where one of the comments, and I'm not even sure which paper it was, indicated that they could only apply one communication tower on the water tower without going up further. And that's, if I read that correctly, that's inaccurate. You can put three or four on the, on the ridge of the uh, water tower facing the direction that you want to receive the signal from as long as they're about 10 feet apart. And given the fact that we are going to be taking this issue of communication towers to a workshop to find out uh, how we can least impact any neighborhood by co-locating uh, using stealth technology or whatever else for us to immediately kill this is one of those options for doing that seems to be putting the cart before the horse and I can't support it for that reason in particular if, the, if my if the information in the paper was correct that the planning board felt that you could only put one tower on the, on the or one communication signal on top of the uh, water tower um, that's that's wrong and uh, obviously I, I guess I won't say they didn't do their homework but somebody missed that one if that's the case and I'm not going to support receiving this report if that information was, in fact, that I read was accurate. And, so thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fritz. I, I guess my, my thinking is a lot along the lines of uh, Councillor Roberts in terms of, I, I think I will vote in, fa er, uh, in favor of, of accepting the recommendation because I don't think the tower should be designated as a tower overlay district as the district is defined now. But I would like to still keep the water tower in the mix as we discuss various other high points in the town where we could put some relay kinds of um, cell tower facilities there, um, self kind of technology. Um, so that's a little confused, but <laughs> and my vote in favor of this is not meaning I will totally eliminate the water tower as a possibility for some other way of handling cell phones. Okay, thank you. And Councilor Mould. Given Councilor Roberts' questions and comments and Councilor Fritz's comments um, as far as we're not crazy about this but we might want to relook at it there seems to be some question as to what the appropriate approach is here and given that we're going to be discussing this this Wednesday night at workshop I would move that we table this item until next month so we've had a chance to discuss it in during the workshop um. The table you perhaps, per, I'm not sure you can offer a tabling as an amendment to the current motion that's on, on the floor, and I hope that's not true because a move, uh, a, a motion to table means that all discussion must stop. So perhaps you were just thinking about tabling it rather than actually making a motion at this point. Is there anyone else that wanted to speak? I think oh, well, there might have been. I'll, I'll revisit that in a minute then. Okay, so that was just a thought <laughs> as opposed to a real motion. Nice okay. <laughs> Councillor Back. I agree with uh, Council Roberts' comments. Um, last time we visited the issue of cell towers, we decided that it seemed counterproductive to address the issue piecemeal and that Instead, we asked that it be set for workshop. We asked the town planner to assemble whatever background and research she could to permit us to 
make a more global assessment of all of the options. And it seems that to accept this report at this point, um, just two days before we're set to consider all of the materials that our town planner has assembled for us, takes us back to the piecemeal um, assessment as opposed to a global, a more global look. So I would also be in favor of not accepting the report at this time to give the council an opportunity to consider all the options. And it may very well be that the recommendation being made um, by the planning board is one that the council will accept, but it seems to me to be just slightly premature to accept it at this point. Councilor McGinty. I'm willing to amend my second to send this report to the workshop. And I was willing to withdraw my motion. <laughs> we have a plethora of options here. Um, if you are going to withdraw your motion, perhaps. I'll make yeah, a motion uh, that we but, send uh, this. Before, I guess, I just want to say, um, I have a lot of confidence in the planning board. And I, I don't want the withdrawal of my motion to be interpreted by anyone on the planning board as lack of confidence in what they've done. Um, I um, highly respect their views on planning issues in this town. And um, I will tend almost always to, not always, but almost always to defer to the planning board. Um, in this particular case, I had opposed even sending it to the planning board because it had been looked at a couple of years ago. It was found not to be a good location. It's a densely populated neighborhood. Um, but the planning board did look at it. And so, um, I, again, I just want to say I defer to their judgment, but I'll withdraw my motion in the interest of being able to look at this whole thing at a workshop. Okay. Councilor Moles. Likewise, my request to table is no indication of which way I, I stand on the issue, only that I thought that, as Councilor Backer said, two days before we're going to have a workshop on this issue was probably not the night to, to vote on this. So I would move that we send this uh, item to the workshop for discussion Wednesday night. That's this Wednesday night, two nights from now. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of uh, considering this planning board recommendation at our Wednesday w workshop. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Can I just, um, I, I note in the materials that were at our desk, um, tonight that there is a letter from um, the Sprague Corporation um, that they've reached an agreement with U.S. Cellu Cellular. That was in the papers that were placed out before us um, asking the council to look at the um, location of a tower at our workshop on the uh, 16th. So I just want to make sure if we are looking at um, Shore Acres that we're also including um, the Sprague Corporation's request um, so that we are looking at things all at once and that the planner and whoever else needs to be there um, would be there to support a fulsome discussion of the issue. Ms. O'Meara, do you have something to add? I definitely plan to be there. Uh, my understanding is we have nothing else it indicates where this site is that they are asking you to consider. All that has been submitted to, met to the town is what you have before you tonight. Okay. I just want you to know that. Councilor Lynch. Can I ask through the chair then to communicate to the Sprague Corporation um, and uh, U.S. Cellular that if they want us to even consider it, they need to get information to us tomorrow? Tuesday for a Wednesday workshop? I think that's a reasonable request. If they want us to consider it, we need 24 hours to look at it. 
could um, we ask the assistant manager to, along working with Ms. Amira, to make that call? We can certainly ask her. Okay. When would we actually get it? The town yeah. hall's closed before a lot of us go by town hall in the evening. Well, it's awfully short notice. I, we can ask and see what they say. Mm -hmm. If there's anything they can include by email, they'll have to do their best, but it is very short notice. So I'm not sure how productive our discussion will be on the, on the Sprague site, but we'll just have to see what we see what we can get in that short time period and deal with it then. And if we have to have another, if we have to have a discussion Wednesday night at the workshop that um, that goes on, we're, then we will have to do that. We want to make sure we do the right thing for the town on this session. Uh, and I'm not suggesting we rush any decisions, but. Um, I am suggesting if they don't get anything to us, they don't stand a prayer of any discussion. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we are back in order. We are on item number 13, which is consideration of the Gullcrest Master Plan DEP permit easement. Ms. O'Meara, could you orient us, please? chair if you want to join me up here that would be fine uh, but the Gullcrest property I think most of you are familiar with it this is uh, an aerial photo this is the master plan that the planning that the uh, council approved I think it was a year ago or more than that and what we've been doing it's it's a large 120 acre site um, we have a master plan that shows a network of interconnecting trails um, along outer loop trail, inner loop trails. Um, it's important because this site, it's an important facility for the town, but it doesn't have very good connections to the rest of the town, especially on foot. Uh, across the street from where we go, we can get onto the town farm, but we have the schools and the town center up in here, and in order to get there, you have to walk down the town center trail all the way down here, and then walk down to where we go, and then you finally get into the site. It's, it's over half a mile just to get to this point and you still have to double back. So the, the, the big piece of this plan was to create a connection on this existing trail with the big loop trail of Gullcrest. We call this the Spurwick River Trail with the Spurwick River Bridge. And we discovered that uh, trying to get a bridge crossing uh, over a coastal wetland is never something you, we'll ever want to apply for again. Uh, it's very difficult to get regulatory wise. Uh, this plan has been before the planning board. The planning board approved it. All of the bridge and boardwalk locations that are in wetlands have been approved by the planning board. We decided we sent everything to um, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Federal U the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we even applied for a permit from the U.S. Coast Guard for our little pedestrian bridge. Um, we're here tonight because after a year of what I think would be fair to call very hard negotiation, uh, we we have received permits from the Army Corps and from the DEP with one condition. And the condition is that the wetland areas of this property be controlled with an easement that the DEP would hold. Um, in our negotiations, and I, I, I did a summary for you that's before you, and unless you want me to go through all the details again, I won't do that right now. But let's just say we spent a lot of time arguing with the DEP over how high this bridge would be. They have rules that say your bridge has to be as high off the ground as it is wide, uh, which would have meant we originally asked for a six foot wide boardwalk. It would have had to have been elevated six foot off the marsh, which quite frankly we thought would have been very ugly. Um, in addition, it would have been prohibitively expensive. <coughs> we narrowed the width of the boardwalk to four feet and they said, fine, you only have to elevate it four feet now. But we still thought that would be way too visible and expensive and ugly. Um, after some very hard negotiation where we said, look, this is the marsh that the town of Cape Elizabeth owns, that if it was privately owned by multiple property owners, you would have multiple dock applications that were elevated one to one, but all those, all those docks will have more impact 
than our one little pedestrian bridge because we own the whole marsh and we can control what we're going to do and we're never going to want to come back for another one of these bridges again because it's so pleasant to get one now. And they said, fine, prove it. And so they, we put together an easement that only regulates the wetland areas. It allows us to do everything that's on this master plan. It allows us to go back to the DEP if we, if we have to do other things, but it's one extra layer of protection for them that allows us to get past this one-to-one -one height to width rule. And we're asking the council tonight to agree to um, grant this easement for the Department of Environmental Protection. Questions? Thank you. Any questions? Councilor Roberts. Maureen, mm -hmm. on the, this easement, is it just the one bridge or trail, or is the easement that covers all the other trail, trails? It covers the all the wetland areas on the site. And the bridges right. and boardwalks and other things that are proposed, mm -hmm. what is the width going to be? It varies. We've got permitting um, that goes up to 10 to 12 feet, so it allows us to expand it. But in fact, in our discussions with the council when we originally brought this, this plan forward, there was a lot of concern that there be as little impact on the wetland as, as wetland as possible, that we try to make this a very affordable plan, but at the same time, we allow the boardwalks and bridges to widen out if we have more funding, if we have perhaps Nordic skiing coming in and having a lot more support. Uh, so it varies in width. So this one, though, the, the bridge over the spur length is going to be four feet. That the, is, the that bridge, let me correct, the bridge will be eight feet wide. It's a 20 foot long bridge, eight feet wide. It'll have approaches of boardwalk from each end that will be four feet wide. And there's approximately 357 feet of boardwalk that would have to be constructed. And that doesn't have any flexibility on that. It has to be four feet or could it be five feet? If we wanted to go back to five feet, we'd have to go back for the permit. We'd have to, you know, we'd be back to the one-to-one -one negotiation. Um, and we could add another year to this whole thing. Okay, it gets back to my earlier concern that uh, four feet crowns with snow. You can't snow, you can't cross country ski on it. Uh, very difficult to walk on it, they're dangerous. Um, I guess I'll wait to hear what other comments are from some of the other counselors before I proceed further, but, um, and the public works obviously can't get any equipment in. They're gonna have to go from both ends to try to do any work on it and That's not right. be able to get across it. That's right. All right, I'll reserve further comments, I guess. Any other questions for Ms. O'Meara? Councilor McGinty. Having read the town attorney's letter, what's the downside to this by granting the easement? I think the only downside is, is there's one extra layer of control over an area that the town owns than, it current, than there's currently existing. But I honestly think that the easement is really not very valuable to the DEP because we really aren't going to want to do any more than what we're proposing to do. There's a lot of wetland boardwalk work just in this master plan. It's going to take us a while to implement this. And our own rules, our own wetland regulations would have to be changed. Uh, it's just we're not giving them anything of any value because we're not going to want to do anything in these wetland areas. Did, did I read that right, though, that if we wanted to do something, we could go back? I mean, this is, this e we could change the easement. Yes. If, if they agreed. But. And the, there were some issues that the town attorney raised in his letter that I added in. He was concerned about the septic treatment plant and, and I, I threw some of that language in and uh, DEP has seen everything that you, the, the easement you have before you has been approved by the DEP. So they're, they're ready to issue the permit based on that language that's before you tonight. So this is, this, is, um, this recommendation is a, approved by the Conservation Commission also. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, um, I'd like to point out that in addition to what Marina has told you, that this uh, bridge is a uh, key element in our whole trail system throughout the town. Uh, it is our top priority on the Commission in all our trail network. This is the number one priority. We feel that we must have this bridge in order to connect North Cape, the northern part of Cape, to the southern part of Cape, so that people can, can walk 
uh, all the way through. And that was an original goal from many years ago from when Dr. Peter Rand uh, first proposed uh, the trail network to be able to hike uh, from North Cape, from Fort Williams down to Crescent Beach. This bridge will allow us to do that with a few more connections uh, that we think we'll probably be getting in the next few years. So it's a key element in our very key element, perhaps the most important key element in, uh, in the whole trail network. And we do urge you to, uh, uh, to, to grant this uh, easement. It's very important to us. And the Conservation Commission is unanimous in this. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Uh, Councilor Fritz, I'd, I'd like to move um, approval of the easement um, to go with the DEQ permit as presented um, for the, it really is, it, it's three separate covenants, does that need to be, so not on the town farm west, on the marsh there. When the, when the town attorney, the town engineer and I met with DEP, they said they wanted easements over everything, and I drafted them, and then I sent them over, and they said, we don't want this one. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> so, yeah, we're down to two. And, and, and the reason we're down to three. two, the reason it's two is because we have two different deed descriptions, and we're trying to minimize our cost to come up with a meets and bounds description for one piece of it. We have three easements in our package, though, Gull Crest, mm -hmm. East, and West. Yeah, you don't need the west. So which which are the two that we do need? Gold Gold Crest Crest and town and town, town farm, farm east. east. Town farm east. The reason there's two is because this portion of the property is part of the old town farm, and we don't have a meets and bounds description for it. My understanding is that it would cost thousands of dollars to prepare something like that, and so what we told DEP is. We'll use the exact same language that we received the land from, which is from the will of Thomas Jordan. And then the lower half is the portion that the town purchased. I think we call it the Luray, not the Luray parcel, but we call it Gullcrest. And because it was purchased, I think it was in the late 1990s, Jack? In the 11th. Yeah, we have, um, we have a meets and bounds description for that. So again, we are trying to put these easements together, spending the least amount of money possible and reusing information we already had. Okay. Um, so, Councillor Fritz, your uh, motion would be for those two, two easements. For the two easements. Is there a second? There's not a second. I'll second. Okay. There's a second. Discussion. <laughs> you guys are all in unison over there. <laughs> Councillor Lynch. Okay. I, um, can I pose a <coughs> question to Certainly. Maureen? Um, how typical of this is this of the DEP to require um, an easement, particularly of a town that's trying to do its best to protect land? It seems rather, um, you know, I guess a little I, bit offensive to me. Yeah, as a local official. I feel confident that that there's no way that we could get the DEP to grant us this other than appealing it to the Board of Environmental Protection. Uh, you know, picture nothing short of me taking my shoe off and pounding on the table. Uh, we spent many, many months negotiating with them. We hauled six different DEP staffers out to the site at various times. Um, I think the fact that they were willing to vary this one-to-one -one rule uh, was a big step for them and they felt that the only way they could do that is to at least get something more than what they usually get. I don't know how many times they asked for easement uh, from other towns. I know that in the town of York they basically had to hire an attorney and, and negotiate what we're getting without having to go through the expense of the attorney. Okay. Um, the concern I have is one of binding future councils in perpetuity, I think, for this. I, unless I miss it, I don't see a term in okay. these easements. So okay. we're essentially granting the DEP in the state of Maine, I think, some substantial property rights in the property that the town owns. 
Um, so for that reason, I, I'm very uncomfortable with it, and I guess I would feel better uh, before doing that. Uh, perhaps if we have to hire an attorney or we have to go to the board, and I don't think we necessarily need to hire an attorney. I think we can go to the board. Uh, Excuse me, to which board? The Board of Environmental Protection um, and appeal the staff's decision without an attorney. So uh, before I voted to grant an easement, um, which would stand in perpetuity um, and give the state rights over the town property, I would rather see us go to the Board of Environmental Protection. I recognize that we don't have a lot of money and we don't have money for lawyers, but um, I would feel that even if we couldn't hire an attorney, we ought to go to the board and ask um, and go over the heads of the staffers. I've, in my own practice, seen times when the DEP staff has um, insisted on things that the board doesn't. So um, that would be my position on this. Thank you. Councilor Moore. I'd like to echo Councillor Lynch's comments and Councillor Roberts' comments. The Goldcrest area is a recreation area for all the town residents. And this issue came up uh, last year about cross-country skiing. I saw it come up before I joined the council. And I am not in favor of shrinking the boardwalk to four feet without trying one more time to see if we can't get a six-foot boardwalk approved so that especially in the winter months, those residents that want to cross-country ski through that area have the ability to do so. Uh, now, I can't control whether it snows or doesn't snow, but on those years when we do snow, get snow four feet, by the time you're pushing with the poles, creates a rather dangerous situation. It's not really wide enough. You're going to be pushing off the edges of the boardwalk. Uh, and I would like to see us, again, not give up that kind of an easement to the DEP without really getting what we asked for to begin with. So I'm not, I don't like Council Lynch, I'm not crazy about that idea either. Okay. Councilor Backer, did you have a comment? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a question uh, for Maureen. Um, and, and maybe I'm finding the answer to it as we speak here. I, I guess um, attached to the packet is the uh, department order uh, from the uh, DEP, main DEP. And um, I just wanted to find the language where main DEP was promising the compromise that was being represented to us. And is it in this order? It would be in B, the, part, the summary, I think. It, it describes the four-foot-wide boardwalk. I think 1B, I think. In, in section B, it says the applicant also proposes to, is this where you're referring to, to construct a 341-foot-long four foot wide boardwalk mm -hmm. and a 20 foot long eight foot wide bridge across the upper Spurwink River estuary. Is that the description you're looking for? That's what I thought. Yeah, there's, a, there's a description on page three of five that talks about under B minimal alteration. I'm sorry, could you say that again please? There's a description on in the order on page three of five under B minimal alteration. The last line says the applicant proposes to minimize the habitat and visual impact to the salt marsh by limiting the width of the walkway to four feet and locating it two feet above the salt marsh substrate. So is that for the, you know, maybe I missed something here, but now I'm getting confused. Is it the boardwalk, the long boardwalk that's four feet long and two feet elevated? Yes. And what about the bridge? The bridge is eight feet long, eight feet wide and 20 feet long. Okay. What's and how high? feet hot? How many? It, what's it, the mid well, at the deepest height? part of the channel, it's elevated 12 <coughs> feet off 
the so bottom speed of off the, the water? Yes. Or off the bottom of the channel? The bottom of the channel. Okay. Was that what you were looking for, Councilor, Councilor Backer? Well, I guess I'm looking for its, its main DEP's imposition of the conditions that are included in the uh, covenants and I that we're asked to sign. David, what I think they usually do is make the applicant describe, so it's in the, the, con it's in the summary of the project. You say, you state this is how you're going to do it, and then in their findings they generally say that they approve it. There is a restrictions on the covenant area on page two where it begins the on the town farm east while well, while we're shuffling that. papers is there any other counselor who would like to make some <coughs> comments <coughs> did you have a counselor backer again on page five of five number three in the middle of the page what is it Mm -hmm. Prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall submit to the Bureau of Land and Water Quality a recorded copy of the deed restrictions protecting approximately 75 acres of wetlands in perpetuity. Is that the reference to the two easements we're talking about? Yeah, that's, I, I, I suppose that's what I'm looking for. I guess I was looking for something more specific that required us to approve what is before us. Um, I mean, I, I, I assume that the requirement is in there, but I didn't quite see it set out as clearly as I'd like it to be mandating us to do what we're being asked to do in order to get this boardwalk in. But, um, I, I share the same reluctance that um, Councilor Lynch articulated. Um, I, I'd love to see a boardwalk in there, but I hate to sort of literally, figuratively give away the farm to get it. Um, and would like to know that we really exhausted all, all efforts uh, before we handed rights to the state over that property. There is also a timing issue. We're Which is? not gonna be able to build it this year. If, if we can't, it took us a year to get to this point. And I understand your concerns and certainly you don't need to approve this. Um, but both the Army Corps and the DEP permit are conditioned upon this. And if we do nothing more than say we wanna appeal it to the board, we will lose this construction season. And you know, I'm concerned that if it doesn't get built this summer, whatever funds we have set aside will not be available in the budget next summer. Councilor Moles has had his hand up for a long time. Well, and in speaking to that, we want it built right the first time, rather than be unhappy with the with the end product. It, and it's probably certainly worth waiting for. And I would, you know, if possible, support the financing for it next year or help raise that from private funds. But I just wanted to comment that in my asking you to go back and negotiate this, I wanted to convey to you and your staff how much we appreciate the hard work that you put into this and have put into it so far and will continue to put into this and all the projects that you work on. And I really wanted to say this earlier, so I'm gonna say it now. Earlier, we had David Sawyer speak to us from South Portland, and I really took umbrage with a lot of his comments and chastisement of our town planning board and our town planning office. Here he comes to ask us to work together in the future, and he starts out by chastising the town of Cape Elizabeth and the way we do things. I don't think that was very constructive, and I have occasion to ask items of our town planner and the office upstairs. And it's not because I'm on the town council. Before I was on the town council, they always 
came forward very quickly and gave me the items I needed. So I just, I just want to put that in the record that we really appreciate the hard work. I really appreciate the hard work that you've put into this. And I'd, I'd like to see it done properly. And if it's, you know, I think it's probably worth waiting another year for if that's what it takes to get it done right. Um, I think Carol had a question, then Jack had a question, and I think Mike Duddy had his hand up out there, if I'm not mistaken. So, Carol, first. Well, I mean, the reduction in the requirements of the DEP are the request of our Conservation Commission. I think they're correct in trying to make the, the boardwalk less visible. I mean, if it was sticking up in the air the way the current requirements are, which I, I assume they're making requirements of other towns that have done some of these things. You cited some examples. Yeah, we, we discussed this with them, and they've never permitted a public boardwalk before. They put us in the category of piers, docks, and wharves. We pointed out that those are private structures and that it was inappropriate to apply the same rules to us. Um, they were undeterred. Uh, we pointed out that uh, their biggest concern is with shading impact. Uh, we pointed out that if a boardwalk is oriented east-west, even if you elevate it at one-to-one, -one, you have a dead strip in the middle of the boardwalk, and that our boardwalk is basically oriented north-south, and therefore we're not having any greater impact than uh, someone who is orienting a boardwalk east-west and following their rules. Uh, certainly, you know, we can go back and we can talk to them again, but I, I do believe that Councilor Lynch is right that there's, there's no more room for negotiation with staff. It would definitely be an appeal to the board. But just to finish that as well, um, I mean, I don't know what our chances would be of going before the board and they simply impose their rules. Um, and then could we step back and make this deal? You mean go back to their original to rules? this proposal mm -hmm. in order to try and get a reduction in the height of that boardwalk. Um, and we'd be stuck with a higher, uh, wider boardwalk. Um, so, and I, I feel as though what we're giving, we would be giving them an easement to protect in perpetuity, which is what I think we would want to do and what, we don't want to develop that part of the marsh and they're not asking to do any development. So um, I think our protection with an easement is is better protection than we would have otherwise and, and meets the goals of the town. So I would favor going ahead with this. Council, Council Roberts. Unfortunately, the easements over the entire property, and if you look at the maps, close to 70% of it is listed as one form of wetland or another. So we're really turning over control of almost everything that's not already developed to the DEP. And I had a company I decided to write down here as to a how I would sum up the DEP, but I'll, I'll, I won't bother saying that. But let's let it suffice to say that they can be rigid and inflexible mm -hmm. on stuff that does not meet common sense. You know, you can show them it's common sense to do something one way, but if their rules are written the other way, you can't get them to budge an inch. And I'm really concerned about that. And Mary Ann summed that up very well. Um, I have two other issues with that. that we've, we think we're not going to do anything, but there's, there may be at some point behind the high school, there's an existing trail that connects in this way for a loop. We don't know if down in the future the, a, a ski club or somebody may want to make that loop. Um, right now it's not proposed, but with this easement and based on what I've seen with the DEP, forget it. You're never going to get it. The other concern I have, and I've been after this for years, there's a lot of flat territory in there, but, but according to the DEP, it's wetland areas, and they would not allow us to make it ADA compatible or accessible. And at some point in my life, I suspect I may want to have it ADA compatible. <laughs> and I would like to think that I could still get back there and enjoy those trails. And I don't see the DEP giving us the flexibility to do that. Um, I like Marianne's suggestion of going to the, uh, and appealing that 
to the board and taking it beyond the staff level because I'm not impressed with the staff as far as trying to work with us. Mr. Duddy, did you have a comment that you'd like to make? I do have a few comments and thank you for the opportunity for waving my hand in the back a little bit. I was happy to sit it out, but given the chance to talk, um, I will. Um, I sympathize with the great struggle um, many of the council members are having. I was one of the original skeptics of the proposal that's being put in front of you now. Um, but I also speak as one of the people who for, it's been well over a year, year and a half or so, has been actually going to the uh, DEP meetings at least initially before my frustration level got overwhelmed and so on and so forth. But, um, I, you know, I, I just don't know that Maureen and, and um, uh, John Harris have painted the picture of the heroic struggle we've been through so far for staff. And the only point I wish to, to further on that point is that if we go back to the DEP by appealing, um, having looked at the science involved that they've been providing us and we've been providing them on shading, impact on the aquatic uh, plant life and so on and so forth, if what we're looking to do is ask for wider boardwalk approaches to the eight foot bridge, um, I think we could appeal it um, and do everything else that we want to do, and it's going to go nowhere because the science cuts against us dramatically on that. If what we're going to do is get it into a debate with the DEP about somehow minimizing impact or compromising on impact of the vegetation, the concept that we're going to get a wider boardwalk approach to the bridge is not going to convince anybody who's going to say, well, we're concerned about the environment. Um, what we might get, what I was lobbying for early on in the proposal, was an eight-foot wide bridge to accommodate skiers if ultimately um, they want to start using that path to do some skiing with a sh uh, short ramp up to it on either side. But keep in mind, um, the bridge is going to be two feet off the surface. It's 12 feet to the depth of the channel, but think, just think in uh, terms of two feet off the surface of the ground. Not all that high with a short platform up to it, a ramp that would work for skiers, and then just our traditional two plank wide boardwalk sitting right on the surface of the marsh leading up to it so that in the winter time, hopefully it would be covered by snow, it would not impede skiers and so on and so forth. It seemed to me the least intrusive, impactful way to go rather than dealing with this 300 feet of four foot wide boardwalk. Um, that was also um, dismissed out of hand because if you lay something on the plant life itself, you're going to pretty much build plant life underneath it. Um, when you look at the science involved, and we, we actually communicated on the commission with several marine biologists up and down the eastern seaboard um, about is there going to be, if we had a war of experts, somebody out there saying that, well, you could build yourself a six foot or eight foot wide boardwalk approach and you know, space the treads uh, an inch apart, orient to north south, and you're still going to get plant life down there. We're going to lose that argument. By going to the DEP, um, appealing, maybe what we can do is exert some sort of political influence and hope that a town can back down the state agency. But on the science, I think we're, we're going to be under, undermanned and undergunned. Um, having said that, if that is indeed what the council wants to do, then I think the prospect of doing it on our own without some sort of assistance, legal and expert or otherwise, is going to be essentially a waste of time. Um, Maureen has really advanced the technical argu uh, arguments we've been not just to the staffers but to the senior people in the local DEP um, district office. Um, they're going to fight mm -hmm. tooth and nail um, with claws for their position, which they feel they have already dramatically um, compromised on. So all I would urge you to do is if you are going to go the way the route of an appeal, then just like you want to do the, the bridge and the boardwalk right, then I'd urge you to do the appeal right. Don't now just cast off a full year of construction and getting the trail system up and running on really tilting after a windmill. Arm ourselves and go after them with everything we've got because that's what it's going to take to move the state agency. One of the reasons that's what's, what it's going to take is that we're not just dealing with the state, we're dealing with the feds. The only reason that we're getting so far a permit 
um, for this bridge from the Army Corps of Engineers is that they're bought into the compromise being advanced by the state. They have the same rule. They have the same one-to-one -one ratio. And if we're going to fight it with the state, we're going to also have to fight it with the Army Corps of Engineers. They have a whole different cadre of personnel that we're going to have to deal with. That's why, even though I've been an original skeptic of this plan, and in some respects, I still don't like the design that we've got, I myself, and, and, and just offer this as a personal conclusion that the commission is back with, is to move forward with something. We've got a multi-use trail system, not just a Nordic ski trail system. There are a lot of people in town who would like to be able to start using it. I've had countless questions over the last year and a half about Aren't you going to do something at Gullcrest? What happened at Gullcrest? We heard about the Gullcrest master plan. The whole thing has been on hold while we've been through this difficult struggle in permitting. We have an ability to modify the easement over time. One of the things, frankly, I'd like to see is with an eight-foot bridge constructed there two feet off the ground and boardwalk leading up to it, we could essentially do our own research on the impact to the aquatic life there. And if over time we can demonstrate um, that impact is minimal, maybe we can get the boardwalk approaches widened. Um, but in the meantime, this would at least get the plan up and running. But I understand that there are you know, very weighty, significant um, local policy issues to deal with. If you reject that um, um, uh, recommendation, I urge you then to really think about staffing up and going after this appeal with everything that we've got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Ross. <laughs> I was trying to sneak away fast. I know you were. <laughs> My comments on making some of the trails through the woods in areas that truly aren't wetland, but are, but are labeled as wetland. If we take and put the seasman on, what is the likelihood that we'll ever be able to do anything like that and get it by the, the DEP? Uh, I'm not sure I understand exactly the question, but we've got this plan laid out. This is what's permitted, and they're not handcuffing us in particular on width of boardwalk in these other sections. What they're dealing with is the, the, uh, the, the marine, the salt water um, section up here. So we can have wider boardwalks through these areas. The rest of it's being permitted up to 10 feet wide, again, to accommodate the uh, interest from the skiing community to at least allow in the future an architect with permitting architecture to go that wide. Really, all we're talking about is the connection here. Now, everyone has different opinions on it. We have not consulted um, a professional ski course designer, but some skiers have said, you know, if what you have to do is what you have to do, I mean, for this length of the, the uh, boardwalk approach, I mean, skiers understand that's a local um, course challenge that they have to get across. And the bridge will be wider to accommodate some passing if somebody is right behind somebody at that point, so on and so forth. It's not perfect. I mean, it just is not perfect. Um, but, you know, if we're going to try to do better, I think we're going to need more than just the, 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 the moral argument here. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Dan. Any further comments? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Lynch. I, I want to be clear both to the staff, um, the rest of the council, and the public on what my objection is. And it's not to the width or the height of any trail. And I respect all the work that everyone has done. And I respect the DEP's expertise in this area. And I think that it's fine that they dictate what the width and the height is in this order. My concern is with the DEP holding a gun to our head to give them a conservation easement over 75 acres of town land. And I just for the life of me don't really understand that connection because the DEP has in their power to tell us what the width and what the height and what the location will be. And when they issue the order, we have to follow that order. If we don't follow that order, they can bring an enforcement action against us. So I, I am just troubled on the DEP requiring us mm -hmm. to provide them with a conservation easement for 75 acres of town land. That is my whole concern with this, not the width or the location or the height, but saying we have to really give them enormous property rights. 
be clear on why I will be voting, <laughs> I think, against the motion. The motion was made so long ago, <laughs> I've forgotten it, but... Councilman Moll. And for the record, I would like to echo those same comments about the uh, easement, but also, again, I don't think that four feet is going to be sufficient, especially if you consider the ADA aspect of it. If you happen to have uh, two wheelchairs that want to pass on the boardwalk, except on a bridge, they, they won't be able to pass. You know, so someone will be backing up for quite a ways. That's a fairly, some fairly lengthy sections of boardwalk. And, you know, I'm just trying to think down the road. I'd rather have it built right from the get-go rather than have to try to go back later and, and widen it. Councilor McGinty. Um, I've had, many, when I've read um, our attorney's letter, I had the same concerns that uh, Mary Ann had about why not just say this is how you got to do it rather than, you know, secure this huge easement. Um, I was under the impression this was our take it or leave it position. I um, wanted to get this project done where we have to accept, as Mary Ann said, the, the gun to our head. Um, but if there is a possibility that we can appeal this, I'm, uh, I'm willing to go that route. Um, and so at the appropriate time, I will withdraw my second for the motion at the appropriate time when the discussion is complete. Okay. Are the Councilor Fritz. I, I still am in support of my motion. Um, I, I think a huge amount of work has gone into this. Um, I think they've attempted to do the best they could with the staff. It sounds like they would be very difficult and would fight it at the board level, the, the DEP level. Um, I still think it would look better lower uh, as is proposed here. I think it would be very expensive to fight because I think my study is correct that we should do it right if we were going to fight it and it would be expensive. And I'm not sure what we would have when we were completed. I mean, we, we have no intention to uh, develop that marsh area and the, DE, and the DEP agreement would not have developing it. So I think we would fight it, and I don't know what we'd have in the end that we're so uh, we're fighting for. I don't think the DEP is going to try and develop in the market. Further discussion? Councilor Bassett. I really appreciate everything that uh, Mike Duddy said, and it's um, for taking it all to heart, and I Mike, thank you for, uh, for all the time you've spent on this. I mean, you provided a lot of great insight. I guess part of my concern in walking away from this proposal as it's presented now is, and I don't know whether, Mike, you have any insight into this question, and that is what happens if we appeal and we're not successful? Yeah. Um, is this an offer that will still be available to us, or um, is it likely that it will be withdrawn by DEP? Do we have any way of making an informed decision on what the likely outcome of that would be? Would you like to come forward, please? I was just wondering how we wanted to come up and speak to that. Yeah, please, yes, please, if you don't mind. It's my understanding that this is an offer of compromise, as attorneys understand it. They're making an offer of say, saying, essentially, we understand that you may try to stare us down here and appeal this and go to the board. We'd like to avoid that because as local staff, we don't want to have to go under that scrutiny and potentially lose. Um, if we go and we lose, we have lost a lot of the leverage that we currently have to try to push forward this compromise. Um, so, whenever you go move forward on your way to the dispute resolution form, you don't know if you have that original offer in hand. This has not been a particularly friendly negotiation um, with local staff. I don't mean that in a personal sense with the staff members, but they feel very much like we have backed them down considerably already that they are, in fact, abandoning their principles of trying to protect the, um, the marine environment and so on and so forth. They, they have a strong agency institutional 
commitment to what they're doing, and they feel that they've backed off from that. Will this offer still be there? The insight is we simply don't know. Um, that's one of the risks in moving forward. What we've got now is not a perfect resolution. These compromises seldom are. You know, would, politically speaking, because it's a town taking um, the agency to an appeal, would we, would we be able to politically force this offer to still be there? Maybe. But it's not as if the staff is representing that, well, gee whiz, just appeal it, and if you, don't, if you lose, come back and we'll do the same thing. Uh, it just ha hasn't been that way at all. So I, I think it's a risk. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Any further discussion? I, I would just add, I'm persuaded by Mike, if we don't take this, we're probably not going to get it. And there has been an awful lot of work in this, 30 years of work, actually, not just the past year. I'll support it, kind of hold my nose, I guess, with it on the DEP thing. But I think we were able to lose it all without, support it, without supporting it. Councilor Backer. Yeah, if I can just follow up with what, well, if I did my last comment here. I think in light of the risk to us in, in going forward, and again, I am taking very much to heart, and I think Mike is giving us good advice, that if we're going to appeal this, we have to appeal it meaningfully and it is going to require funds that we as the council having just gone through the budget cycle know are pretty hard uh, to come by at this point um, and going forward with an appeal less than fully prepared and with the uh, financial backing required to do it um, I agree that the appeal will be a long shot and if we do get forced back to the DEP with, and we're faced with a decision of having to build with a one-to-one -one ratio of height to width, and the cost is prohibitive, mm -hmm. then we are left with no completed boardwalk through the marsh, which I think would be a real loss for the town. Something that we all want to see happen and I guess um, you know I also am not willing to gamble with the possibility of ending up with no boardwalk through there because we can't afford it if money were no object and I was satisfied that we could if build money were no object you would not be our finance chair <laughs> I realize that so um, you know I also will support it because I think it's, um, it is a compromise. And um, all other things being equal, um, I'm not willing to take the risk of ending up with nothing through there. Councilor Mould. I'm not gonna support it. And I think we need to stand by our principles. And I think Councilor Roberts and Councilor Backer think long and hard about whether we wanna give over easements to the DEP. I think we should rigorously defend and support the rights of the residents of Cape Elizabeth. Really, almost a home rule issue. We shouldn't be allowing the DEP to try and grab this easement from us during this negotiation. And again, I really appreciate the hard work that Maureen O'Mara and her staff have put into this negotiation and the Conservation Commission. Um, I don't think we should back down at all. I think we should find the source of funds to take this to the next level and defend it. And if it comes back and they don't want to offer it again, then I think we find the source of funds to defend it legally again. Because it needs to be done right. And we shouldn't have to give up to the state of Maine, DEP, our sovereignty over this marsh. We, if any town around here, do such a fantastic job of protecting and conserving land, it's insulting for them to try and push this conservation and perpetuity on us. And I ask you fellow counselors to truly support what Maureen's done by taking it to the next level and not having to give up our rights to that mark. Councilor Lynch. I am um, certainly listening to what Mike Duddy has said and um, agree with him that if we're going to appeal it, we should do it right. Um, but I 
I think it's more important to make sure that we do do this right um, than to put up a trail that a number of people uh, here in this room have expressed dissatisfaction with. And I don't see any guarantee in this, these documents that the DEP won't tell us to do it some other way five or ten years from now, and they will have the easement as well. Um, the easement doesn't permit us to cut any trees, grass, shrubs, vines, or other vegetation. It seems to me that we might want some cutting, if only to per permit some scenic vantage points along this trail. So, I uh, again, I go back to the DEP can tell us what to do and how to do it and where to do it, but I, for the life of me, can't see why we would give them the rights to 75 acres in perpetuity and not have a guarantee that they won't tell us five or ten years from now to go back to some other uh, way of building the boardwalk. Thank and you. It, yes, it, it is a risk. It, life is always a risk and whether you appeal these things and, or not, but I, uh, I think we, it, it has been a 30-year vision and a big investment. And I just hate to see us um, do it in a way that just that doesn't make sense to the town and um, doesn't give us the protection we need. Thank you very much. Okay. I, I have a comment. Um, I will be supporting motion if it isn't withdrawn. And if it is withdrawn, I hope someone else will second Carol's motion. I will be supporting it. I've been persuaded. I, I was listening very carefully to the discussion and people on the various sides of the issues have made very persuasive arguments but i am persuaded by mike study's comments and the conservation commission's recommendations i i personally hearing everything i've just heard think the chances for a successful appeal are low and i am afraid of the risk that it could backfire and we could end up with something even worse this is not ideal, what is being proposed. It's not ideal, it's not perfect, but we all know it's not a perfect world. I think the pros outweigh the cons. The DEP has compromised somewhat on their strongly held views. I think we are going to have to compromise, too, to get the best deal that we can reasonably get for the citizens. And I understand it's not ideal, but I will be supporting it. Councilor McGinty, I didn't know if you... I, I have, I guess, Ann, you just stated that you thought the chances of a successful appeal were low. Mm -hmm. I don't have that certainty tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we have enough information on that. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to at least suggest that um, before we take action on this, perhaps we get a little more information on what our chances of success would be. There would be, and, and I appreciate that Mike has offered his viewpoint, um, but I think there are also other people who we might speak to at little or no cost to the town who would at least perhaps on a volunteer basis be willing to look at this, who do a lot of work before the DEP so that we could have that particular fact and piece of information before we take a vote. Facts, they're a beautiful thing. Facts are important. But I am persuaded. Um, unless there are further comments, I want to ask Council McGinty, are you withdrawing your second? I am. Okay. So the motion is still on the floor the, um, to grant the Gullcrest and Town Farm East easements. Is there a second? No second? And I'll second it for the purpose of taking a vote. Okay, I, I, I certainly hope there's no more discussion. Right. No more discussion. Um, all those in favor? Okay. All those in favor? Are you distracted? Are you distracted? I'm, I'm sorry, I was... <laughs> We're discussing I was parliamentary. Distracted. Okay. Counselors? Yeah. Counselors, <laughs> counselors, we've, we've got a vote upon us here, um, and we've yeah, got one I've side of the room voting, but the other side <laughs> chatting. We need to, <laughs> we need to vote. Um, procedurally, 
point this, of order this, is that this what you're may, looking for? This, yes. this may or not, may not be in order. Um, I've already stated my thoughts on how I'd be inclined to vote on this. However, I am always interested in getting more information. Mm -hmm. And if it's a matter of having this delayed for a month to permit us to consult with whomever may be able to give us some more informed insight as to what the likelihood is of a successful appeal. I don't do any work with the DEP. I have no idea how they operate. Um, I'm certainly game to get that information. Um, as well, it stands I, right now, I'm inclined to support this as is. Well, I, we've got a vote sort um, of in mid-progress now, and if the vote fails, then perhaps there could be another motion. But I think we need to move the question. So <laughs> we, need, well, we need to move the question, I believe. So <laughs> make a motion to table, though, which takes precedence over. Not in the middle of a vote. Not in the middle of a vote. Okay. <laughs> nice try, but defer. not in the middle of a vote. <laughs> I repeat, we were in mid-vote. All those in favor of the, the motion that is before us. Then I'll support the motion. It's four, all against. Three. It's four, three. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, everyone had very heartfelt opinions on that, and um, I appreciate the hard work of the Conservation Commission. It sounds like it's been hard going, and we appreciate very much your efforts, and we also appreciate Maureen O'Meara's efforts, too. This is a difficult question, but I think we can agree that reasonable people can disagree on this item. Thank you very much. Moving on. Item number 14, which is um, to consider a request from residents of Fenway Road to repeal the ordinance involving parking on Fenway Road. We have um, a letter before us from James Hughes. He has enclosed a petition signed by 14 of the 16 homeowners on um, Fenway Road asking us if we would repeal our ordinance, a recent ordinance change and go back to the pre-ordinance status quo. Is there a motion? Okay. Councilor McGinty. Okay, I'll just state that there's a memo, a memorandum from the Conservation Commission dated June 11th that was in our packet on our desk that they, um, Conservation Commission has no objection to allowing parking on one or both sides of Fenway Road. And I think they were the first ones to bring it to us after a public forum on the whole access to Great Pond situation down there. Um, and they were under the impression that the people wanted parking on, uh, no parking on one side, parking on only one side. Um, and obviously the, the people, um, uh, don't want to restrict parking on their road by the petition. I think we got all but two of the neighbors down there. Um, and uh, I've talked with some of them. They certainly say that's not a problem at this point. I don't see any reason to send this back to the ordinance committee. It probably would be the proper procedure, but I would make a motion that we uh, repeal the, uh, the ordinance, whatever the ordinance number is, um, for parking on Fenway Road. And it's been moved and seconded, and could I just ask a uh, procedural question? I'm going to ask our ordinance chair, <laughs> um, or perhaps the assistant town manager would know. Do we have to send this back for a public hearing next month if we are going to change this ordinance or repeal this ordinance? Don't we, when we make ordinance changes, have to do that? Yes, yes we do. I was hoping the answer was we didn't have to, but I... I think our options here are, if, if we want to take, take that action, if we want to um, go along, return to the pre-ordinance status quo, I think we have to set, ask for a public hearing. Okay, and I'm, I'm trying to avoid sending this, obviously trying to avoid sending this back to the ordinance committee. Um, I don't see any useful purpose in doing that. Um, so perhaps I could modify my motion to set for public hearing for our uh, July meeting 
that's one area. Yes. Um, that we have a public hearing on repeal of this ordinance. Okay, so that's your motion. That would be my motion. Sure. Okay, is uh, Carol? You had seconded. It. Would you yes. second it? The amended motion. Yes. And it would be July 12th. July 12th. Um, discussion. Uh, discussion. Comment. Yes. Um, as a member of the ordinance committee that recommended the approval of the of parking on one side of Fenway Road. In fact, as chair of the ordinance committee that recommended that, um, I want to say that the only reason the ordinance committee recommended parking on one side of Fenway Road to the council was because we were under the impression that the residents of Fenway Road wanted parking right. restricted to one side of Fenway Road. Um, the Conservation Commission was obviously under the impression that the residents of Fenway Road wanted parking on only one side. Um, never was it presented to us at either the Ordinance Committee meeting um, or at the public meeting itself that the residents of Fenway Road, short of a couple of residents that came, were opposed to parking on one side. The argument that we had heard um, in opposition to it was that, I think the comment was that we were turning Fenway Road into a parking lot by restricting parking to only one side, which we didn't understand the objection to that, and we did what we thought was a service to the residents of the neighborhood. So I am happy to permit parking on both sides of Fenway Road um, and support it being um, set for public hearing next month. Thank you. Councilor Moles. When this came up at the meeting on uh, April 12th, uh, we did have several residents come and they all spoke against this ordinance and I voted against this ordinance at that time. So I'm more than happy to bring it to meeting on July and I'll vote against it again to turn it down. So. I, I hope you mean you'll be voting for returning, because that, since that's what it will probably be, for returning. It would be a positive vote, but in any event. As you so tightly put it, I'll we, be voting to return parking to both sides of the street. Okay, thank you. Is there f further discussion? Okay, all in favor of setting this for public hearing next month, uh, July 12th? It's unanimous, 7-0. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't think to recognize that they're, I'm sorry. I apologize. I should have. But could you step to the podium, please? Just. We're going to have a public hearing. It's not a public hearing, but are you Mr. Oh, Hughes? I understand this is a public hearing. My name is Fred Brown. I live on Fenway Road, Cape Elizabeth. And I'd like to know why, if this was being brought before the council, my wife and I were not notified of this meeting. Well, this is... Excuse me. I have neighbors here that knew about this. I did not. Why? Was it because I didn't sign that petition? Frankly, I have no idea. Does the assistant mayor... Well, I'm bringing it to your attention right now because I, I am really can't. peeved. I have neighbors here that knew of this meeting this evening. I knew of this petition. I'm not in favor of this petition. And I didn't receive a notice of it. Sir, I don't think it had to be legally noticed, and of course oh, there, will be, me. there will be a public hearing next month. And ah, but it, it was on the agenda tonight, was it not? Yes, the publicly published agenda. Yes, but I did not receive any notice that this was going down tonight. You, and I can see I'm sure where you're just, correct. Huh? I'm sure you're correct. As yes. far as I know, you did not. We didn't send anybody any public notices, did we? No, not that I'm aware of. I contacted Mr. Hughes, as he is the one that signed on behalf of the neighbors. Uh-huh. So somebody was notified that something was going to be taking place tonight. That's Why right. wasn't all 16 people on the street notified? Mr. Hughes signed on behalf of the neighbors. Oh, so only on 14 of them. 
So again, I, I call Mr. Hughes because he is the one that signed on behalf of those that signed the petition. Yes. A courtesy call to him so that he would know that it was on tonight, because I'm not sure if he talked to the town manager who got the letter to know if it was going to be on tonight. So I did that in anticipation that there would be another meeting of action on your request. Uh -huh. Now, will I be expecting another meet, uh, notice for the next month? I'll have to check to see what the noticing requirements are, but certainly we will, I will talk to the manager to make sure that those that need to be notified are notified. Right. I can assure you that there was no intent to hide this meeting from anyone. It's been on the agenda. Well, and I, sir, I just find it very sir, funny because... Sir, you're out of order. If I could finish my comment, please. Um, there was no intent to hide this from anyone. Mr. Hughes was notified as a courtesy because he had written the letter. The way the process works is that there will be a public hearing whenever there is an ordinance change. And that's why we just had this vote so that everyone in town will have an opportunity to speak. We would be more than happy to hear your comments at that time. But frankly, discussion of this matter is over. We appreciate your comments. I did neglect to ask people beforehand if there was anyone here representing the neighbors. And I do apologize for that. I'm sorry that you feel you were not notified, but there will be a full opportunity at the public hearing for everyone to speak. And I hope you come back and express your views at that time. If I understood you correctly, to have a ordinance change, there has to be a notification. So therefore, I will be getting a notification the next time around. There has to be a public hearing. I'm not particularly sure what the rules are on it. I think it means a public notification in the new newspapers when there's a public hearing. But you can, I would assume you can consider yourself notified at this point. Sir, you know it's on the agenda. I will be here. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Um, item number 15, to consider referring a non-stormwater discharge ordinance to the Ordinance Committee. So moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> well, that was exciting. Um, okay, it's been moved and seconded to um, refer the non-storm water discharge ordinance to the ordinance committee. Is there any discussion? Who is, um, is McGinn. Bob Malley staff on this or is um, <coughs> Maureen? Um, Bob has been attending the different meetings. You know, that's why I was wondering, yeah. Hey, well, Bob will be spearheading it with working with Maureen and our town engineer, in fact. I mean, I know it's been an ongoing process for Indeed. a long time. Yeah, <laughs> two years ago. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor? It's unanimous to send it to ordinance. Thank you very much. Moving on. Item number 16, which has to do with the acceptance of a grant for the Thermovision Scout. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there anything that the chief would like to say about this? Chief Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, back in August of 2003, I was notified by one of the sergeants that uh, the government was doing a giveaway. And uh, the application came up in October of uh, 2003. And uh, it just came about in uh, May 2004 that they awarded them. and. Uh, I believe that this particular device will assist us at nighttime. It's an infrared uh, thermovision scout that will uh, allow us to detect uh, people walking at nighttime. And uh, just so the council knows that this item, if purchased, uh, would be about twelve to fourteen thousand dollars. Okay. Thank you. Don't go away, <laughs> Councilor Roberts. <laughs> Question for the chief. How does this differ from the thermal imaging camera that the fire department has? It doesn't. It's, it's, it's about the same technology that will see through smoke and uh, also see in total darkness. So it's basically an, an additional piece and more training for more users? That's correct. The government will pay to have uh, one officer uh, flown to Baltimore for training 
all expenses paid. Sounds like a good deal. Okay, thank you. Councilor McGinty, did you have yeah, I was just going to add that <clears throat> it could, it can be used for searches for people, you know. That's correct. You know, not just strict law enforcement um, for applications, but for people who are lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Further, further comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Councilor Backer. Yeah, Chief, are there times and places recently where you, when you wish you would have had one of these available to you? But definitely, I mean, uh, we did have, as uh, Council McGinty said, uh, there was a search at one time a couple years ago um, with a patient that uh, left the uh, nursing home, and we could have used it that particular night. Matter of fact, they tried to use the thermal imaging camera from the fire department. Um, so would that have helped? I don't know, but it, it's another tool that we could have used at that particular time. Also, when we have uh, people out at nighttime and, and in the fort, it'd be, a, it'd be an excellent way to locate them. <laughs> and on the, on the beaches or, or, or wherever, it would be an excellent uh, device to locate the people. Also, you have to understand that it's officer security. Um, when the officer can see what's out there and the other person can't, and uh, you never know what you're walking by at night time. Any further comments or questions? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. The kids are not gonna be happy. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> it's unanimous, thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Okay, item number 17. Uh, consideration of a recommendation. I should have asked you to stay up at the podium, Chief. Consideration of a recommendation from Chief Williams for the town of Cape Elizabeth to contract with the City of South Portland for animal control coverage until December 31st, 2004. Chief? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, just recently, our animal control officer uh, went on to uh, Falmouth, mo moved away from here, and went on to Falmouth PD as a patrolman. Um, we looked at that position, the animal control position, and felt in light of all the referendum questions coming up, that it would be best to try to uh, regionalize the South Portland on this animal control issue. Um, so contacted Chief Ed, Guggen, Ed Guggins from South Portland, who uh, contacted uh, Jeff Jordan, the city manager. And uh, I think before you tonight, you can see where um, the uh, figure of $6,623.68 came from, which would be a 30-week uh, period that we would try this. And uh, that would be 25% um, of the salary, health insurance, and other benefits of the Animal Control Officer of South Portland. The only downside to that would be that we would not get the full-time coverage that we do now. But that's what we're all looking at, budget cuts and whatnot, so we're going to have to try to uh, implement this and uh, see how it works. I think it's uh, a rather uh, good idea to try to um, just look at it for a 30-week period and see how it works out. Okay, thank you. Could I just ask, are those 10 hours a week scheduled for certain times of the day? or on an ad needed basis or we're going to try to do that as an ad needed basis however uh in talking to stan brown who is the animal control officer down in uh, south portland uh, we do need a little coverage out here for our um, so-called trouble areas uh fort williams and some of the areas out by um, um the uh, town farm that we try to just keep control of we know that dogs can run free on that particular property, but we try to um, prohibit or, or, or make sure that when they're supposed to be on leash, they are on leash. And uh, Fort Williams in the morning is, is one of our troubled times. Uh, most of it will be on call basis. Uh, the officers will be following up on uh, certain cases. However, uh, rabies cases or uh, sus suspect animals and dog bites, uh, Stan Brown for himself will be following up on those. Thank you. I didn't understand the end of that sentence. Uh, for rabies and... Well, when we have a suspect case, like uh, say a dog uh, attacks a woodchuck, mm -hmm. and that animal has to be taken up for testing, uh, we'll, we'll have Stan follow up on those particular cases. Okay, so he would do those? Correct. 
Is there a motion? Councilor McGinty? I, I move uh, <coughs> approval of the um, of the contract, I guess it is, the contract to South Portland for uh, animal control officer coverage. If I may, Madam Chair, uh, uh, I've contacted Chief Guggins and uh, they're having legal counsel draw up the contract. Okay, thank you. So really we're uh, approving the recommendation. At this point there is no contract, but approving recommendation of, for Chief, of Chief Williams. Yes. Okay. It's been moved <clears throat> and seconded. Any further discussion? Councilor Backer. Well, I just like would note that if the contract hasn't yet been entered into, um, there aren't 30 weeks left in the year. Apparently there were 30 weeks at the time this memo was created, but now we're two weeks farther along, or has South Portland's animal control officer been providing services for us for the last couple of weeks anyway? We have asked them to provide services. Uh, our animal control officer left, I believe it was like May 23rd. So um, the contract would be retroactive for a couple of weeks for services that he's already provided. I, I believe in all fairness, yes, it should be. Okay. Could, could I um, ask uh, if, as a friendly amendment, you would accept um, authorizing the town manager to sign a contract so that it doesn't have to come back to the council again? Uh, yes, I'll accept that. Okay. Further questions? or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Okay, item number 18. Um, approval of an identification system policy. We have before us um, a policy that has to do with photo identification badges for employees of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Is there something the chief or the assistant manager would like to mention on this? Madam Chair, this was a uh, an, another um, item that the uh, town manager placed upon me to look into and uh, um, gratefully so. Uh, we um, I would say it was back back along uh, October way. Uh, we formed a uh, committee uh, made up of several different uh, department uh, personnel. And um, through the Homeland Security and, and not tax dollars, we purchased a um, photo ID system uh, for the town. Uh, we felt that it was uh, time to make um, the town buildings more secure or at least have an identifier on all town employees. So if you saw a person that you may not know, but had an ID system on, or an ID badge on them, you could at least check that out and know that that particular person belonged in that building. Um, and we're also expanding that into the school system. Um, if we have an incident, whatnot, down at the school, uh, we, we feel that uh, even though Many, many years ago, I attended schools in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I am now quickly losing track of who the, who the teachers are uh, because of the cycle. The officers that come in do not know who the teachers are. So we feel it's a good, good way to keep track. Uh, people that call in incidences uh, in our town buildings can show their ID badge, show it, and, and, and we have a little bit more faith in, in that, what that particular person says. So with that being said, uh, we, uh, we had a committee of uh, uh, several different people and we came up and presented the town manager with a policy, I, I assume it's before you, and uh, we have gotten uh, pretty much all department heads and, and employees to buy onto the system. Um, I can show you uh, what, what we're going to uh, produce out of the system if need be. I have one with me tonight. And uh, we feel that uh, you're going to do that, Jack. Um, but uh, we, we feel that it's a, a quality system, as you can see from this particular ID. And um, we feel that we need to have a policy in place in order to have uh, all all employees buy into this. And uh, it, it gives us it gives us and the department heads a, a place to start, and maybe later on. Uh, see how this particular policy works 
and then go from there and if, if need be to uh, tweak it a little bit. But uh, pretty much all in all, it's been a uh, positive uh, comment and feedback from the employees and department heads. Are there any questions for the chief while he's here? Councilor Lynch. So do I understand this is a no cost program for the town? That's correct. Uh, all, all materials and, and system were, were purchased through Homeland Security money. Who's going to maintain this will be program? This will be, this is placed in the uh, police station right now. The reason being that we want it in the police station is it's under a secured area. It's on a lockdown area. There's only certain people that have passwords that can manufacture these IDs because obviously you need that particular protection so you know who you manufacture an ID for. So that's why it's in the police station and there are only, uh, I believe, four people that will be manufacturing the IDs from town-wide. And then, uh, may I ask one more question? Um, uh, we obviously wouldn't have any authority over the school department's imposition of this. It strikes me that there's perhaps a higher need at the school mm -hmm. than the town. What, you said that the school was involved in discussions. Are they implementing this? How do the teachers This feel particular about program, um, if uh, those of you that were on the council at a particular time recall, um, I brought this uh, up approximately, I think, three years ago. And that was a funding, of um, a capital improvement funding, with half bought by the school and half bought by the town. However, um, we couldn't um, see to, to fund it at that particular time because of, um, as, as now, tough budget times. Um, at that particular time, it was um, um, with Tom Fusella, the superintendent then, that it was going to be implemented. And he, in fact, put in his budget uh, for, the, for the other half of that particular money. Um, we did have the uh, business manager and Gary Lenoy, the um, tech person, on board on the policy. And he has been... Um, the person that is going to do the photo IDs for the school. But I think that this should be an item that will be discussed with a new superintendent incoming because it will be um, his or her responsibility to make sure that that's enforced and that it's uh, forthcoming. For, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Roberts. Chief, has there been any problem with people misplacing them and losing them? And how often, if you have, if you expand it, will there be a cost to employees if they basically aren't taking care of them, continually losing them? Well, we, we touch base with several different other um, communities and facilities, such as Portland Water District, that does this. Um, and, and yes, they're, they're, they have implemented um, certain, certain costs, but it all goes like, um, Portland Water Districts, theirs is technically a proximity card on the back of it, so when they go into their buildings, they can swipe it, and um, so there's a much more greater cost to that particular card. I believe, and don't quote me, but I think that that card right there that you hold in your hand will cost about $1.95. I was more concerned with people not taking care of them and there being all kinds of cards out in the... We, we can keep track of that and, and address that. It's also an expiration date. Yeah. Well, that, on the, on the back of the patrolman's cards and my card, you'll see that we implemented and put our concealed weapons permit on the back of that. So therefore, we've kind of done a, a two-tier two system. What I've also um, will implement with this particular card, of, I've contacted the Attorney General's office and what I'd like to do, and sorry for taking so much time, but what I'd like to do is implement this into our concealed weapons permit that, that I'm responsible of issuing, and we will now require a picture, which I can do, and we'll make it a plastic um, concealed weapons permit, and we'll, we'll, we'll obviously charge for that particular thing. But um, as you can see, I, I believe it's a lot better than a piece of paper that has a signature on it and no identif identification on it. Chief, I have a couple of questions. Um, these are for 
town employees, and I understand Councilor, Councilor Lynch's questions about school employees, but I do remember that uh, Superintendent Priscilla was in favor of this program, and I think the schools have been looped in. I would want to reassuring on that point. But what about um, the town council, the school board? I mean, for, there are some, I would assume there are some board members, <coughs> volunteer board members and volunteers that would not really fall under this policy, but I wonder about the volunteer firefighters and counselors. You know, there's a few things where I can, I'm not sure which category, who would fall in what category. The, so, and I think counselors. The rescue members all have photo IDs that were issued a couple of years ago now from an old system before this was around. They're not as, not as uh, high tech as this, <laughs> but we, you know, we have them. Okay. Um, for identification purposes. Uh, the reason, firefighters don't. The reason I, it just came to mind because I know that counselors, for instance, get the employee discount at the fitness center, and I just happen to know that because I went to the fitness center. But there are a few categories of people that I'm not sure, and I'm, it, we don't have to determine that right now, but we may need to figure out where the line needs to be drawn as to who's an employee and who's not. I can, I can tell you we, we've spoken on most of those issues and there, there are going to be tweaking that we're going to have to do but volunteers down to Portland Headlight, they will have one. Won't have their picture on it but I'll have a volunteer and have the town seal on it and we'll show at the base where mine shows the police and we'll show Lighthouse and we'll say um, Keep Elizabeth uh, Portland Headlight Museum or, or whatever on it. Mm -hmm. We made those up. Uh, those will be, Gene will take care of those and handing those out during the day to the volunteers and getting those back. Anybody that's permanent, we, we felt that the town council would have them, the school board would have them, um, and, and, and what we're going to institute at the police department, we can't do it here at the town hall, but we'll have visitors passes. As you know, well know that the police department's a lockdown area. So once they go through into the back, they'll be issued a, a visitor's pass. So they will have, won't have the picture on it, but they'll have say visitors, they'll sign for it and whatnot. So we have looked at several okay. of those issues. And, and community services is a, is, a, is a tough one that we've been looking at. And, but, but Sue's on board with it, and Janet's on board with it, and we're going to um, do the best we can. Okay, thank you. That makes me feel better. Um, been so long, I can't remember. Have we had a motion on this? No. Not yet. Can I ask oh. one question? Yeah. How much of the Homeland Security funds have been allocated to this chief to make it a no-cost program to the town? Uh, I believe it was nine thousand dollars to buy all the equipment and and um, and set up and um, and training. And was that Homeland Security money that was? earmark specifically for this program? It, this particular system falls under the Homeland Security money. Several, several different communities are, are doing the same, purchasing this, this particular system or other systems for ID badging. Were we required to use the Homeland Security funds for an ID system? No. No, but that fell, but that fell under the criteria we could utilize it. All, all, all funding has to go before a board. Um, you request and you say what you want to use it for, and the and ID badging system fell under that. We, we felt that, uh, I mean, like uh, Madam Chair knew three years ago, we, we tried to do this because we felt it was a, a, a much needed thing, especially in our schools. I'll, I'll be honest with you, in our schools, uh, when we go to a, an incident, we like to know who we're dealing with. And um, so, so when this money became available, we felt that this was one, one item that we could purchase and felt that it was a good purchase under the home. And are there further Homeland Security funds that are earmarked going forward to keep the program in place for a certain number of years? We have certain funding. I don't know if it will be in place at that particular time. But we, we bought the, uh, we, what I feel um, through the committee, is, is the, the best equipment that we could buy at a particular time, um, well known throughout New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Maine, and, and um, uh, 
we did our homework with contacting other communities and they've had little or no problem with their equipment. Uh, yeah, we have to buy some stock and cards and whatnot, but once we do the initial outlay, we should be, should be all right. And actually, we, we purchased the initial outlay with that $9,000. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and seconded to, um, I guess, approve the identification system policy. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. Okay, um, next item is item number 19, which has to do with a request from the Down East region of the Porsche Club of America to utilize Fort Williams Park on Sunday, May 22nd, 2005. Ms. Lane, would you like to say anything about this, or don't you feel the need? No, in your packet you have the, the letter from the uh, Porsche Club and the approval of the bill from the Fort Williams Park. Is there a motion? I move approval of the uh, date, May 22nd, 2005. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Can we, can we have some discussion? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I never I thought you were giving me the look no, that meant no. so fast. As no, and I realize it's late, and I apologize to those of you who are saying, what is she going <laughs> to say about this? But. I don't want to miss an opportunity um, to just make the point that we could look at fees for Fort Williams again. It strikes me that the $175 from Porsche Club members is not a lot of money, and I realize that's not before us, but I'm raising it because I actually had several people in the last month uh, asked me whatever happened to fees at Fort Williams and they didn't realize we had discussed it this year because we did it in a finance committee workshop. So um, for those of you out there watching who think that fees for Fort Williams are important and ought not to be forgotten, I just want to go on record to say I haven't forgotten <laughs> and I would like to amend or propose an amendment to the motion to say um, that if the fees are changed between now and then, that our commitment is to the Porsche Club at whatever fee might be in place at that point in time. So you mean change if the fee? If we were to after change the fees between now, between now and the date of their um, yeah. show, we would, we would have agreed on at 175 fee now, but then we would raise the fee. Yeah, and that we're letting them know that the, the agreement is subject to any change in fee. Is there anyone who wants to second that amendment to the motion? I'll second it. Okay, let's vote on the, well, is there discussion on the amendment, Jack? I'll vote for it, but it's kind of a moot point. I don't, can't believe that if you've already made a commitment with somebody that you're going to try and charge them additional funds. Well, your commitment is conditioned on the fact that the fee might change. Well, <laughs> Councilor McGinty. But you know, they—they've already said. I mean, their letter discusses the lead time that they need because they need to make mm -hmm. commitments to hotels and what other other facilities they're going to use. Um, I think that if we decided to suddenly charge them a prohibitive fee, they may think it's prohibitive. That all their planning is going to go down the, down the tube. Okay, then I'll withdraw my motion and put in place of that a motion that the fee be $500. Is there anyone who would like to second that amendment to the motion, the $500 price? No, second. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the $500 price? Well, I, I can't support that. Um, I think that's too premature to start setting fees without having much discussion with the Fort Williams Commission and others who may be stakeholders in this rather than just 
us arbitrarily at 10 o'clock at night setting fees for these things. I think uh, we need to go through a political process before we start doing that. I'll, I'll withdraw my <laughs> motion. <laughs> just please. But I'm trying, to, I'm just trying to make a point that fees at Fort Williams will not be forgotten this year and I will use, as we start the new year, I will use every opportunity. Um, and it just strikes me as we um, cut this and cut that and don't have money for things that we want, um, we could be charging more, particularly the Porsche owners who are using our wonderful resource for a day. Um, and there are a number of others, so I will just kind of stake out my position now and I am not going to make the mistake of at least letting the public think we've forgotten it because we haven't and they haven't forgotten it either which I was just pleasantly surprised by the number of people who'd asked me about it in recent weeks. So. Councilor Moll. I'll also withdraw my second <laughs> okay. but Thank you. mention that unlike some other events held at the park this particular event could cost the town a lot of money in police and public service coverage. Thank you. Um, I, I would add that I too have not forgotten Fort Williams fees. I'm still interested in the subject, but I don't think we should be changing fees at this late hour. And I, I really have a concern of sort of advertising at one price and then trying to jack up the price. So I, I don't think we'll be supporting that. but. Yes, well, if I if I might mention, typically we don't allow setting a event until January first, so it would not be that inappropriate for us to mention to them that between now and January first, you know, the cost may change, and I think as a percentage of the cost of the overall event, even if we, you know, doubled the rate from 175 to. 350. It's a drop in the bucket, drop in the bucket compared to the cost of their overall event and planning. But again, they are asking us to do something special and give them an almost a year's notice that we don't normally give. Thank you. I think we have a motion before us from the distant past, it seems, um, which is to approve this. Was it Councilor McGinty? Yes. To approve this as is, which I would assume would be the 175 price, and the, the date of Sunday, May 22nd. So it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Seven. <laughs> we got the message, Marianne. <laughs> Thank you for that lively discussion. <clears throat> okay, uh, item number 20. Appointment of Deborah S. Cabana to serve as General Assistant Administrator. So moved. So moved second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? I was going to say have fun. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Um, you, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Yes, it's unanimous. Thank you, Deborah. I'm sure you'll do a wonderful job. Okay, item number 21. A request to approve year-end transfer. Ms. Lane, is there anything you would like to say about this on the manager's behalf? He's uh, written us a memo for the public who may still be watching. I think the memo is, um, Michael's done a good job in, in detail and outlining what our needs are um, in terms of the year-end revised appropriations. It's um, unbelievable to think that we're at year-end again, uh, ending June 30th, so we are preparing for that. Councilor McGinty. I move that uh, we uh, approve the revised appropriations as uh, submitted by the town manager. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, whoops, I have a piece of paper there. <coughs> Item number 22 is a recommendation of the Appointments Committee to fill a vacancy on the Recycling Committee and the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees. And I don't, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, um, I Brick. think it, at this time the Appointments Committee is ready to recommend filling the vacancy on the Recycling Committee only. 
Okay. And and that would be rough here to fill the unexpired term that expires December 31st, 2004. And there is no recommendation with regard to Thomas Memorial Library? Okay. It's been... So I'll take that in the form of a motion. And that be another continuity with that. Okay. So I'll, I'll take that as motion. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. That, that ends um, the regular uh, items listed. Uh, I understand that a counselor has, Councilor Roberts has a procedural question on one of our votes. Yes, thank you. On um, the item that we had for the, uh, the Gulf Crest Trail, the 4-3 split, I know there was some trepidation, I guess, in approving that as is and whatnot. And I was just asking, can, does it have to be signed tonight, or could we hold off uh, actually signing it to a, a week or two from now so that some of us could perhaps, uh, in the prevailing, on the prevailing side, see if this is the way we want to go with that. I don't want to see it go to the DEP and then next month have somebody vote to re move to reconsider. It would seem um, we don't want to get the paperwork up there ahead of where people may be on it. I know, um, so I guess I'm asking the council not to sign it this evening but and then if it, nobody wants to if nobody's thinking about reconsidering it within a week we let it go i'd say for one week i am no procedural expert but it seems to me that we have had a vote on it and that the only way we could i, I i'm hesitant because the conservation Com conservation commission folks and ms amira have already gone and uh, it would seem to me that we would have to have someone on the prevailing side move to re reconsider it. That could be done either this evening and that could or be this done meeting tonight. It doesn't have to be done on the next meeting. It has That's to be, why can be done tonight with, with or at the next tonight. meeting. You I'm could, not prepared to do it tonight. You could move to, may I? Yes. You could move to reconsider and then do that and assuming that well, you were on the prevailing side, assuming the votes don't change except yours or whatever, then you could then move to table it to the next meeting. And so that would just give us the, the opportunity to maybe get some additional information and then it's still teed up for the next meeting. But it has to be someone on the prevailing side moving to reconsider. Can I ask you another could, counselor could, a question? Pardon me, go ahead. Can I, David, are you, am I off base or would you like to have some additional time as well as myself to look at some of those things? Yeah, well, I don't think you're off base at all. Um, I don't think we can ever be hurt by getting more information. And I'd like to move to reconsider item whatever it was. Uh, 11. I think it was, no, I think it was 13, wasn't it? I'm sorry. Yes, 13. 13. Item 13, 0405. Yes, it was 13. Sorry. I'm just checking to make sure we're reconsidering the right thing if we're going to do that. So, I'm sorry, what is your motion? I'm uh, moving to reconsider item 130405. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Now we're is there discussion on a move? I think there is discussion allowable. Mm -hmm. Okay, discussion? I'd, I'd actually make a motion first, I guess, if unless people want to discuss it ahead of time. Well, I think. First, you have to get by the motion to reconsider and see if the council wants, as a whole wants to reconsider it. So is there discussion on this issue? Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't know how expensive it would be to fight this thing, which is the key. But, I mean, if we hire attorneys, we hire scientific experts, all the things it would take. I mean, there's that cost, which we certainly haven't budgeted for. And there's, if, if we still, if the DEP said we had to build it like their standards are at the present time, 
the boardwalk would be a lot more expensive. So, I mean, I'm not ready to spend that extra money to get something I really don't think would be visually good over that mile. Um, so, I mean, I just think the, the cost would be tremendous. So. Based on what I heard this evening, I don't think I would change my vote in a month either. But there was a lot of information provided tonight that I hadn't considered ahead of time. And I don't like voting on something I feel is this important um, without having all those facts, as Anne would say. Um, but I don't want to jeopardize 30 years of work either. But I just don't want to see, I think we, we're moving in haste on something that we perhaps should have waited to vote on, in my opinion. Um, we had all of the facts. So could I just ask a point of information? Um, so is your motion to reconsider, are you moving to reconsider the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Is your purpose to um, reconsider it at next month? Uh, not to reconsider the question, but to reconsider the issue at next month's meeting? I believe that's the way we have to do it. I was just trying to get a postponement of a week or so before, before we signed the thing originally so we could see if there was that interest in postponing it to next month's meeting, which is really my preference. I'd rather, if we're not going to re vote to reconsider it next month, if people say, no, we don't really want to go that route, I don't want to hold up the Conservation Commission for a whole month while we wait to give them the same vote. But if there is somebody out there that can tell us that we stand a very good chance of going to the board at, at very little cost to the town and get what we want without having that easement, I'm willing to, you know, if, if it's, you know, 90-10 that we could get what we want and, and not have this easement, I'd go for it. I, I personally think if it were 90-10, Mike Duddy's comments would have been quite different, but other councilors in the room. Council Mayor. Well, I'm in favor of reconsidering it because I, I like Councilor Backer, I think we should get some more information. There may be some things that we haven't thought of that may come to light over the next couple of weeks. We haven't had any other public input. Uh, we had some very good comments from Mike Betty, but we can certainly get some more comments. Um, you know, at the next level, we may win the argument that it's not a war, it's not a pier, it's not a dock, and that that particular rule doesn't apply. Uh, so there are some, I think there are some good arguments as to why we should be allowed to do what we want to do with that. And again, we're back to the other issue of do our residents want us to give up? 70 to 75 acres of wetlands over the DEP. You know, I think we should get some knowledgeable input on the process as well as a little bit of public input on what we're doing there. Councilor Lynch. And uh, I, I think it could be done in relatively short order. It seems to me there are a couple of questions that could be asked. What is the likelihood of success? What is the cost of an appeal? Maybe an appeal is two or three or five thousand dollars versus fifty thousand. We don't know that information. I wasn't on the council when Gull Crest was purchased, but I, am I incorrect in recalling that it was a six-figure purchase price? Was it in the hundreds? Yes. yes. Of thousands of dollars. So it strikes me that we are conveying a large property interest in a what was it, $200,000 piece of property? And to take 600000 $600, OK. So to take a little time to find out what is the likelihood of success, and let's say we find out it's 50-50, um, then maybe we find out that the cost of an appeal might be four or $5,000 to, to go to the board, um, that it's not something that there would be a hearing on strikes me that it's well worth it and we can find that information out in very short order. And I'm not trying to delay this by any means. Um, I respect the council's vote one way or another, but let's just get a little more information. More comments? David? And I would be willing to support the motion to reconsider for the very purposes that Councilor Lynch just outlined, to get the answers to those two questions. What is the likelihood of prevailing in an appeal, and what is the likely cost. Um, and for those two reasons, reopen the vote, 
continue the matter until next month when we hopefully have the answers to those questions and then vote on it again. Okay, further comments? Can I just add, I think we need to know the, the cost of an appeal, and I think that can be pretty vague. It, 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 you know, I'm not sure somebody can tell us exactly how many hours they're going to put in on it and all of that and the expertise, but also the cost of the larger, more um, creative boardwalk or whatever you want to say, um, the, the actual additional cost of construction. Councilor Roberts. I guess to set Councilor Fritz's mind at ease, if we can't get those answers, I'm not changing my vote. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Any further comments? Um, so we have before us the motion to reconsider, and then we were assuming that prevails, which sounds like it might. Um, <laughs> then we will have to figure out what to do with this particular item, what we want to table it until next month and get some information or whatever. But first, um, we will vote on the motion to reconsider. All those in favor of reconsidering item number 130405. That's five. All those against? It's five to two. So, um, motion. Would a tabling motion be in order? Um, and it be, once there's tabling, there's no discussion. Well, I think we so, know what we... Well, well, I just wanted to sort of make sure nobody else had anything else they wanted to say. On the next agenda. We'd want to probably... I'm sorry. We'd probably want to table it to the time starts. Because if we table it, we are going to have to... You want to make that deal? I'll do before we, before we table. Yes. Are we allowed to discuss between now and we bring it up again? For example, if our town planner had something to say to us Wednesday night, two nights from now, not the whole length of what we've asked, but a couple of comments, would they be out of line or she can, can she? Sure. Okay. I, w I would think, okay. yeah, I would think we'd obviously want to give direction to the assistant manager who can relay our concerns to the uh, planner. I would think that she would probably want to put something in writing, you know, official for the record like she does, you know, with everything else. That we want information. That we right. would want information on the likely, uh, a professional opinion on the likelihood of an appeal success and the likely cost for an appeal. That we would direct the manager and/or the planner to find out those. Also, Mr. Mayor mentioned about you know what will the funding look like for next year. I don't know if there's a possibility to carry forward funds. I mean, there's some you know questions like that. I think that, that the council really has to. Have that information to make a determination as well. Okay. But more information. I'd okay. move. I'd move to uh, put this item on the July regular council agenda, specifically to with those two questions: um, likelihood of appeal, winning, and the and at least a, a good shot guess. How's that for language? On what it would cost to do the appeal for a successful appeal. So the likelihood of success and the cost. And, and, the, and was there a third one you said? Just the two. Just those two. Just two items. That's all I. So put on July. And the two questions. Has the clerk set those? And is that a motion to table the next meeting? It was to put it on the next month's agenda. I feel like if it needs to be called table or not, but. Okay, then it's a motion to table at the July meeting. I think we have to because otherwise our other. Um, wouldn't our other actions still be? Oh, probably. No. Hanging out there? Yeah, you need some action, so we need move the table. To sort of stop the action, don't we, that we already took? So That's what the table is. Send us a motion right. to table into the July regular schedule meeting. But before that motion is fully made, how some old you have one? Someone has to back. Oh, I'm, oh if I, you're just seconding, no. that's fine, but I didn't want to cut off I, your comment. I was going to add an amendment to it, to the table. And well, you can't do that, it, so. All right, well, before we second it then, I just want to make sure that we clarify just what it is that we are appealing. Are we appealing the six foot width? Are we appealing the having to give them the easement? We just want to make sure between now and the next meeting we're clear what it is that we're taking to That's, the next level. Those are excellent points. What's the will of the council? Because there's some of us that are concerned about one issue. There are others that are concerned about several issues. We want to make sure that 
we come to some agreement on what it is. Why wouldn't you know, that could be worked Council out later, I assume. Why wouldn't you have both? Okay. Is that the will of the council? Both the merits of the boardwalk issue, although I have, a, I guess, a higher degree of confidence in Mike views on having, you know, his hearing the science, but we can certainly ask both. So the motion is to um, ask those questions of Mike and or the planner to get professional opinion on those two issues and the, the broad issues. I'll leave it to the clerk to capture what was just said. And then to table item 13 until the July meeting. Is that what the motion is? Okay, that's the motion. So is there a second? Been moved and seconded. There can be no discussion on this item. All those in favor? Seven zero. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for humoring me on that one. Quite all right. The democracy. <laughs> um, we're at that point in the uh, agenda where we have citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there a citizen who would like to speak? No. <coughs> um, thus, we will, I will entertain a motion to adjourn, but I do want to announce that following the adjournment, the council is going to be meeting as uh, the trustees of the Thomas Jordan Trust to appoint new members to the grants subcommittee. And then following that meeting, the council will meet as the board of directors of the museum at Portland Headlight for the annual election of officers. And I think those are all the meetings we have coming up. We don't have anything else scheduled, right? No. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. And moved and seconded. All those in favor of adjourning? Thank you very much. <laughs>